and uh, you don't strike me as the type to be tilted for like a full day. Why, what was the difference there? Uh, yeah, that was because of you. <laughs> I was, you tilted me off the face of the earth, and then you tweeted, "Oh, you know, by the way, sorry, I said this shit, whatever." And then I look through the replies on this tweet, and it's just like, "Oh, f good guy, Gingy." And oh, this guy, what up? I mean, what a guy, you know? <laughs> just I mean, you got this guy on I mean, I mean, that's the reason I'm, you got. I mean, by dude, a guy this guy, this guy is egg? so, this guy is so humble. He's just, oh, he apologized. It's like, what do you mean? He f caused all of this. Hey guys, um, basically this video is just a conversation I ended up having uh, with Jinji uh, after one of the MDI co-stream events. We were like like six people on the call and him and I were both there. There's obviously a lot of stuff that wasn't really talked about between our two guilds. It's the first contact I've had with any Echo member uh, since the end of the last race. And we kind of just had a long conversation, mostly him just asking me questions and more so you just kind of going back and forth about stuff that happened during this race and in the past and stuff like that. Just a general thing about rating. A lot of people thought the conversation was pretty interesting, so I'm just going to upload an edited version of it or have Franck edit it. Um, and hopefully you guys like it. Yeah, actually, I've been meaning to ask uh, you about that. Um, so the nerf timing, I don't understand the insides and outsides of uh, the headquarters and everything like that. But uh, from my understanding, the, you did get a message that the nerf was happening a couple hours prior to the nerf, right? Was there no possibility to jump on the PC in that timing and be ready to play during the nerf? Um, I, since so many of you are like playing together uh, in the same area, or what was, what was the reason for the late start uh, in general? Um, well, it wasn't a late start. Later. No, we started earlier. What time was it? Our, our normal... We, by the time we got on and were playing, was an hour earlier than our start time for that week. It wasn't a late start. And the when we heard about it, we were just, it was six hours after we went to bed was when the post was. And we were okay. playing seven after seven hours. So it, a post went out and then an hour later it came out. So the exact timing was basically as people were waking up and walking to the facility, you were reading this post that was made 30 minutes ago. And then when we sat down on our computers and turned my stream on, you guys killed it. And that timing, as far as starting late, we were starting an hour earlier than uh, than our scheduled raid no. time. Because we we did something different this raid. We started progression on day one when maintenance ended, which was four hours after reset, which was 11 a.m. Pacific time. And we kept that schedule throughout the whole raid, just so we didn't like lose any time, basically. So which was which was why we were raiding so much later into your all's day, and it was like different this time. And then on that day, we just woke up an hour earlier. Okay, I mean, we had a little bit of a different... Whenever it goes from uh, one reset to the other, we like to end that last day early, depending, of course, how the uh, tier is progressing, and then have the earliest stop possible on the new uh, reset. Um, yeah, we usually... So we we did that as well. So the, the our second reset was also four hours delayed. We were going to wake up earlier on the second reset, but the maintenance was four hours both weeks. So 11 a.m., Pacific time was when it came out on that second week's Tuesday. You guys did crazy shit on the first day, though. You guys, like, you guys woke up at, like, 5 a.m. or whatever the fuck it was. You guys raided for, like, 20 hours or something doing splits, and then you delayed your sleep. That was something we didn't think about. You, like, slept extra long that night and then went to a normal schedule. Yeah, we went super hard the first day. That was, like, the longest raid hour, I think. I mean, raid day. It felt like the raidest day, raid day we've ever had, just because... It was splits, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I don't feel tired doing a like mythic progression. Like it feels a lot better, uh, but like splits do something to your brain. Yeah, it's, it actually kind of makes sense. Like I feel like if you're doing splits in a day, it already ruins any progression you're going to get. Like, I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever done splits for like 10 hours and then tried to do a hard mythic boss afterwards? Like an actual uh, hard yes, boss? That's a long time ago. So that's why we had changed our... Um, like our mindset around that. Uh, so first of all, we have people on the bench doing splits for people and preparing the lockouts and everything like that. You've probably seen using utilizing our bench players to optimize time, and then we can do like a quick one if it's really necessary. But that's mainly for DPS squeezing. But the uh, long-term splits for hours, you would be doing mythic progression on the day, and then you'd be doing a dinner break, and then you'd be doing blitz for the rest of the night and then you go to bed you wouldn't continue mythic progress afterwards your brain is just gone after that yeah but the the nerf thing is pretty rough i talked about this a bit afterwards and uh, and you you asking about us the late start thing it kind of makes sense because i never spoke about the nerf after the raid i didn't tweet for a month i didn't talk about it i saw a bunch of people 
making up that we woke up late or could have started, didn't start early. We did start early. It didn't matter. But I, I think like maybe a post from them the previous night saying we're planning on nerfing this tomorrow because we want it dead before Christmas Eve would have been okay. But I don't really know what they can do. Because if they did it any differently, you all would have gotten fucked. And this is true. Actually, this is something that people in chat don't pay as much attention to. But there's little small nerfs that matter throughout the entire raid. Like, you know, they'll nerf like the sixth boss or something when one guild is asleep. This raid was different because we got in the raid so much earlier than you guys. Because you guys spent like an extra day on splits. But like in normal days, we'll be on like, like Holandris and like the nerf timing matters. Or you'll be on like uh, Lords of Dread or Anduin or, or Pain Smith or just whatever. And it's like... Like one guild's going to bed and can't get the kill after the thing and the other guild gets like a full day on it. But I don't know how they really could have nerfed it. I, I hate the way this race ended for sure. I'm sure most people do who were involved. But I don't know what other alternative they had, right? If they nerf it the yeah. if they nerf it the previous night, we don't go to sleep and kill a boss. Like we were ahead of you guys oh. the previous night and the, mm. and you guys were ahead of us before you went to sleep. The last three days we basically traded positions when the other person went to sleep just like every other raid. I mean, yeah, it's all, it's always that dynamic usually, right? Like we wake up, we see you guys have been progressing, take a little bit the tactics here and there, we progress further when by the time you guys woke up and like we just saw back and forth like that, you know, outside analyst teams and things like that, big wigs, weak girls, everything's just prepared. So when you wake up, you're just ready to go. Like all of these things. Uh, that's why, man. I don't know. What do you think? I, I mean, I want global release. I've, the whole fucking Europe scene wants this for like ages. I think that's the only way to really make it fair and square because no matter what the nerf timings has been cocking us, I think yeah. in most situations, just because it's American uh, time zones that they usually nerf around. Yeah, like they usually spend they usually spend all day thinking about a nerf. They end at five Pacific time and then they, that's when they get off work and that's when they put it in. And that's like in the middle of our raid and that's two hours before you go to sleep. Yeah, global release obviously solves a lot of things because we're at least playing at the same time. I actually think that's something that a lot of people outside the race don't really get is like the shittiest part is that it's not really the release thing it's just because no matter what we just talked about on Razageth how for the past three days on Razageth before it died we woke up took a little bit of what they were doing progressed they went to bed we went ahead of them they wake up they see what we're doing they take a little bit of what we're doing we go to sleep they pass us that is always going to happen because of that situation you can gain so much efficiency by waking up and seeing what the other team is doing and then and then taking time thinking about it and going farther that doesn't exist with global release both teams are sleeping at the exact same time the feeling of going to bed knowing the boss could be dead when you wake up is fucking like the worst feeling of all time like the feeling of waking up like i don't know uh i i can think of a few raids with this feeling but i remember talking to roger brown after sanctum i think it was where like you guys went to bed with the boss at like, I think it was like 46% or something. And we were at 51 and then you, and then Roger said he woke up like two hours early on accident and we were wiping at like 45.2% or something. And then he couldn't sleep for two hours and you like feel helpless. Like it just fucks your, us. yeah, it fucks your sleep so bad. Like, but dude, if you're going to sleep and they're going to sleep at the same time, not only would it just be better in mm. general, but it, it would remove all of this like analyst up all night copying everyone's shit making sure they're ready like it's just it adds to such a weird dynamic but i don't think they'll ever do it if they haven't done it at this point i don't think they'll ever do it but i i think blizzard should take it further than just global release and i think this is something that i think also the american region will love and that is literally just being able to merge the european servers and american servers so we can play together yes i think that, I think that yeah. would be the best for the game I would love oh, that. that would be I so think if God, I think so if the good. game came out in the last five years, I think it would have been made with EU and NA being able to play together. It's like a relic of a 20 year old game. And they have fixed some other relics of a 20 year old game, like the fact that cross faction wasn't a thing until like a year ago when that was like clearly outdated as fuck. It would take uh something tells me with Blizzard. About ping. It's it's not I bad. Like, I played on EU yeah. from uh, Texas. Yo, yo, actually, no I, one, no, no one ping. can talk it's about 130 ping. It's 130 MS. Bro, it's I'll, not that bad. I'll give two examples. So number one, if you guys have ever queued into a Frostmourne group or you've queued into OCE on oh, NA, it's, you, that's always worse. It, that's it's it's going that. to be worse than EU, and it's still playable. We played in London yep, during Eternal exactly. Palace, and we had 90 ping. We had 90 ping from London to a Chicago server. If you're playing from NA to EU, it's like 130 at the absolute worst. Um, it would not be a ping issue at all, yeah. Yeah, I did Texas yeah. to Paris, and it was 130. 
Did that for two years. Not a problem. Yo, but how would you guys feel about the raid if it was a little bit undertuned? Well, maybe not undertuned, but like, you know, tuned to the point where it wouldn't require nerfs. This has happened before. This this used to be yeah, every I'm, raid. I'm saying, like, how, I'm saying how would that be? Because in Afro, I think they were really good at uh, doing this exact thing. I mean, it was Even like, Sanctum. Uh, like, I feel like... I feel like old year through Sanctum, 90% of those raids required like extremely small nerfs. And at yeah. least, at the very least, the end boss was tuned to be killable with week one gear. I think Gahoon could have died week one. I think Castle, I think uh, Denathrius yeah, dies I mean, week one. Yeah, I mean, Gahoon's here if, uh, let's say, Liquid and Echo was at the level that they are now. Oh, the then, boss is dead boss on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. that would have been. The, very fast. Yeah, a lot of people. I actually love to see that. I'm pretty sure the levels of guilds in old year compared to now would be like, yeah, I really think Cahoon would probably be dead on Saturday or something like that. Just massively better. That's actually been the weird thing about the last two raids. And it's actually outside of like the needing to create a bunch of buckets. The reason why you see people that are like less interested in doing it is just because for us, and I'm sure for you guys, in, in an extent, certainly felt this on Razageth. I don't think you guys quite got to see it on Dathia and uh, Kurog because you started later. It doesn't even feel like linear progression anymore after Sepulcher and this raid. And what I mean by that is like every single day you wake up, you can progress and learn from your mistakes. And there is a end goal in sight and you can get to that goal without any nerfs or changes. In this raid, you get to Dathia, it gets massively nerfed i mean just like fucking i don't even know how big of a nerf that was but fucking enormous nerf you get to kurog it has to be massively nerfed you get to broodkeeper it's randomly perfectly tuned somehow and then you get to razageth and after p1 the p1 intermission was nerfed in literally in half you needed 20 people to go through and do one side and break the fire shields the i don't know how they fucked that up like honestly like i we, we had the theory that they like the dev teams that tested that boss they had the whole raid go to one side and say okay it's fine guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> dude the... i have a, yeah i have a theory got... for it too and then and then storm surge is totally fucked doable but like almost impossible and then you would have had nowhere near the boss damage if you had to do it and then the 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 last phase got completely destroyed it's like a five puller in a new guild right now in the last phase so like the feeling of being able to progress linearly doesn't really exist anymore and it's only since Sepulchre, and I don't know what they changed or how they got it wrong. Because it feels like now you progress until you hit a brick wall, and then they nerf the fuck out of it. And then you progress until you hit a brick wall, and you nerf the fuck out of it. It doesn't feel like you're actually progressing. It doesn't feel like real progression. But it only exists for us. Literally, our two guilds and no one else. No one else experiences this. But it has made the raid certainly less enjoyable and I don't know why it happened. Like, dude, I'm even getting into conspiracy theories because I would like to think that there's no way they're that bad at balancing that they got Storm Surge in the first intermission that wrong. Are they like intentionally overtuning it just to see how powerful we are and then tune it to exactly our power level or something like that? Like, I don't, like, I don't, I don't understand how you can be that off. The well, how can I, how, how do you not deals. take the numbers from? From the previous bosses and just balance yeah. it based off of that that's the thing that's wild to me here's what i think they did this raid well and this is actually similar to why most tier lists before the expansion were wrong because they were looking at raid classes in their pure single target builds and they were looking at mythic plus classes in their pure aoe builds and they weren't accounting for which classes could actually do both at the same time so i think they were tuning razageth health for full single target talent builds and they were tuning those ad phases for everyone being full AOE. And they were tuning them based on two different subsets of data. And they just thought that you could do both at the same time or they just goofed or something. That's the only thing that makes sense to me because like, if you have to run a build to kill an end boss, you need a little bit of both. And it just made the ad phase impossible. But the thing is, is this never happened before Sepulchre. Like Sepulchre, they did the same thing. They tuned, they basically tuned every boss from Holondrus on to exactly our guild's power level. Where previously, they never did that, and they tuned just the last boss to be killable week one, but it was extremely fucking difficult, and that changed. Maybe it was tier bonuses that made it change, right? We got tier bonuses in Sepulchre for the first time in a while, and they're, they're like struggling tuning that because of how much tier we have versus everyone else. I mean, it is super frustrating when you get to a boss and you're just sitting there like, okay, you cannot progress that much further. You can just get more consistency in the earlier phases, and you just need to wait for a nerf. Uh, and if you're ahead, that lead is gone.
I mean, the worst example of the just wall so, was Queen of Shara, man. We were stuck in phase two for a literal week while they figured out how to fix okay, that fight. Dude, God, that was a nightmare. Queen of Shara is a great example because I, I know Jinji knows this feeling too. You were rating that too, right? Yeah, you were. I that feel first, like yeah, I, I think you went out right on Sekuro, I believe you were. Yeah, that was the first. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing. We needed. We realized we were gonna one tank the cool, and then we sat Ben, and then I tanked it to like I think tanked it and raid led until like ten percent, and then we were just like, why can't we just do both? We did it fucking crazy too. I literally took his headset and I raid led from behind his monitor. <laughs> it was fucking janky. Okay, the raid before Ashara, Eternal Palace. The raid after Ashara and Nazoth. There weren't really any glaring huge issues that needed nerfs. And Ashara stuck out so much because there was just a phase and tuning that was basically like impossible. It was doable, but like basically impossible. And then they nerfed it and the boss instantly died. That is how multiple nerfs feel now. And the thing that's significant about that is nothing happened like a year before or a year after Ashara that was anywhere close to that level of mismanagement and tuning. And then I could name four things in this raid that were that bad, that were that off. I don't know why they got worse at tuning things. Like... Like, it must be tier. I remember they said in some interview, Morgan Day talked about how it's much easier for them to tune now because they have this new tool that, like, grabs real-time data and, like, like all this stuff. I they, he said that before Sepulchre, and it's been two raids in a row with, like, the worst tuning ever. So I wonder if that just, like, bricked them somehow. What about new people on the job, though? That's what I was thinking. Wasn't Ashara one of the first bosses that was mostly designed by the people that we have now? and Not, like, the old... Designers. Jinji, would you rather have a heroic week or like it was last trade? I didn't. I didn't like the way we had it now. I mean, the thing is, you're going into uh, splits anyway, always first. So there's no real reason to uh, like. No one's gonna kill any mythic boss before they're doing heroic. Like hardcore guilds is not gonna do that. Yeah, but it, uh, it unlocks mythic plus though. I think that's the big thing because it's so, for plus. like. For we everyone else, it's right? much it better like this. Capped, uh, yeah, but it was just capped. Yeah. yeah. Captain yeah. plus sucks. Off. Everyone hates that. Capping like, in plus I, I sucks, think if but... if you ask most people, they would say... This so I think you can better. do both, though. I see no reason why you couldn't have Mythic Plus ready to go from week one of the season and also do a heroic week. It would be just fine. I agree. I think they should do that. The, I think the only reason it was ever like that was to prevent, like, the World First Guilds from doing like splits to you know do a bunch of mythic plus and then go into heroic and then you can trade gear or something but uh, i'll give you a little heads up if they did a heroic week there would be not much of that week where you were not inside of a raid doing splits so so there would not be uh any time to do that for sure so it would just basically mythic plus would just be used in heroic week to gear your main after it was selected by whatever run you got the best gear in or whatever so, like, it wouldn't actually affect the race at all. Um, and I think that was probably their primary concern in making it like that. So, I think I they mean, could but do you both. would go into Mythic Raid with higher item level, that's for sure. Yeah, but, like, we already are. In I fact, would. in fact, we're, we'd be going into Mythic Raid with higher eye level, but maybe isn't that a good thing? Because you know who's I, who I, whose eye level would go up the most? Everyone else's. Like, yeah. the difference between Echo and Liquid's eye level, every single raid, is eye levels ahead of anyone else going into this, going into these raids. That's because of buckets, like uh, yeah. how many characters we have and uh, how good average item level we have because we can choose our mains based on the gear that drops in each individual raid, right? And people that can just pump in plus will be that much closer to us uh, because they can just bluff in the first week. I would agree with you that I think I dislike the way this time... The, the only thing that seemed hype about this time is like everything was coming out at the same time and it would be like more cool to watch, but like all that viewership went away as soon as everyone did splits for a couple of days. I don't think like viewership or intrigue was even bad during heroic week. Like a lot of people digest that content better by doing it that way. And then at least there'd be way less splits during mythic if they did that, but it would mean a crazy heroic week. Like the amount of stuff going on that week would be insane. You'd be playing all day, every day, be wild, but at least it would make mythic more palatable, I think. And hopefully it would help them with, with tuning. I mean, this was probably the worst tuned raid ever. And is that a coincidence that it's also the first raid where they haven't had a heroic week to kind of get a gauge on where classes and bosses are ahead of time? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. That something says that that would probably be true. Honestly, it just feels like the M, M plus problem where we're overtuning things so that they feel players are challenging enough rather than having to come out with slightly undertuned stuff, whether it's M plus or raid.
How, how much of them not doing a heroic week this time was due to them actually wanting to experiment with it or just them being like, okay, we have to there's release nothing. the expansion here and there's no way we can fit in a heroic week and the mythic week before or Christmas. So fucking uh, everything at once. Probably that. I think it was that, but they were asked about this specifically. And basically what they came up with was, yeah, you know, this time it it helps because of Christmas, but, and then there was a whole paragraph on how they think it would be good for the game. And that they, they were asked basically the exact question was, hey, is this just a season one thing? Or are you guys going to do this in the future? And they pretty much, they didn't say definitely they were going to do it in the future. They were just like, yeah, we think this is just better. And I wonder how they feel about that after this raid. Uh, but I guess we won't know until next season. The word on the street is that there's a heroic week, just to be clear. Like, that's that's what I've heard. But God bless. And I think that would be better for the game. Still have a million characters, though. That that won't go away until tier, until tier is gone. I guess, I guess in the scenario where there's a heroic week, you would need a lot of characters still, but you would need less buckets. But at least the group loot is... Uh, you're relying on less... Uh, helpers in the heroic uh, raid. Dude, and thank also, God. Also, also one uh, interesting thing that uh, I was a little bit surprised. You guys started with normal this time. Mm -hmm. What was the reasoning for that? Well, the ca well, first of all, that was Bubba's main thing. He's like the the split guy. Basically, we chose to spend like what we thought would have been like half a day or a whole day less on splits. We were focusing more on tier, and we knew we could get everyone tier by doing normals out of the way, picking their characters before heroic, and then giving their characters one or two of their characters a heroic run. So basically just lowered the, and we were more geared going into heroic. So it was a like time efficiency versus like overall gear thing. Like we figured that, you know, I'd say you'd probably get a half of an eye level doing heroic than normal. I think that actually ended up being what it was. I think once our guilds were on the same boss, you guys about had about a half a eye level ahead of us. And we felt like that wouldn't have been the difference in that raid. Also, we thought the raid, we were pretty confident we were going to kill the raid in the first week this time looking at PTR. Like we, we okay. thought this is a one week raid for sure. So we were like, you know, make sure we don't want to spend, we don't want to spend three out of the four days and not get enough progression time to kill the last boss. And I don't think it ended up really mattering where it would have mattered was if they didn't nerf the boss and they allowed us, you know, the like probably two days it would have taken to find the damage to kill it from there. I think the eye level would have skewed in your all's favor for sure if that was like the end of the raid. But I think, I mean, once they nerfed it and made it instantly killable, then I don't think the eye level mattered at all. And then there's the uh, one thing as well, like, uh, I think the reason why Blizzard was so far off, I don't think the tier pieces were that massive this time. I mean, they also wanted to keep them simplified mm -hmm. so they didn't have too many uh, different things in combination with each other, especially with... The new talent systems, I think they just bit off a little bit more than they could chew in terms of balancing. Uh, I still think that if they didn't nerf Razagif, I think it was killable that week. No, that's I what I just the... said. I, I think it would have taken, I think it would have taken about, I think Sunday, maybe late Saturday kill for that boss. It was definitely doable. It just would have required healing through basically the room stacking up damage infinitely. Because there weren't a lot of mechanics that were killing you then. It was just the raid damage at the end. You could have definitely lost. It would have felt like Jaina. I think Jaina was the... Uh, oh, uh, Jaina? Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, Jaina back then... I don't remember what strat you guys had, but we went for the full-on ignore all mechanics, kill boss strat. Um, same thing we did in... On a shower as well, where you guys went for uh, playing the fight as intended i guess well we did that for a while on Jaina, but then we stopped we did like a nasa strat where we were trying to break everyone out of an icicle mm -hmm. one time in the last phase that's actually one decision i look back on and if that wasn't like the second time we were ever going for world first we would have never fucking done that again like that that is like prime example of that and ashara of always going for the easier solution of why learn the fight when you can just beat it or why learn this thing if you can just beat it so we did the burn strat we wiped like 12 percent we did some bad math and we were like, this boss isn't burnable this week, which was turbo wrong. And then we, uh, we did the NASA strat for like a day and a half. We realized we could burn it and then we went and burned it and we just didn't have enough time to like get the damage done before the reset, but we ended up burning it too. We, we have a, we have a little bit of a different, uh, mentality on, on some fights. Like, uh, we saw it on uh, dreadlords too. And also what was the other fight? Yeah. Um, on, uh, the second Rygalon as well. Uh, but we dropped the healer 
we have a little bit of a different mindset a yeah. lot of times with some of these DPS uh, check Rigalon fights. definitely made sense. Well, I think Rigalon was a little different because we went to bed doing math and we're like, okay, this boss is dead five healable. Like we can definitely kill the boss five healing. And then we woke up and saw you guys were four healing it. It took you about like five hours or so of four healing to like figure it out and get to the point where you could make it to the enrage. And it was clear that if you made it to the enrage with four healers, it was dead. And then we were like, okay, what do you think is going to be the case? Do we spend five hours learning four healing roughly or more? Or do we think we can kill it in five hours, five healing? We just decided to keep five healing, which would have was good. We would we, we should have killed it. I, did, I don't even, did you guys ever realize that you were on jailer? I don't know if you guys actually ended up realizing this because the enrage timer was not relevant in a four heal strat. Like if you could four heal it, you got to the end of the fight and it just died. Like it was going to be dead. For us, it yeah. was like an enrage check. It was like gonna be super fucking tight. The boss had a variable enrage timer. We don't, we never really figured out exactly what caused it and they fixed it right after we killed it. But the boss was supposed to enrage, I think it was like 7-11. I don't remember the exact time. That's the one that is in my head. And it would randomly enrage from 7.07 to 7.11 would be when the massive bang went off. And we didn't know what was causing it. So on our second pull, we wiped it point like 0.7% or something, but the boss enraged at 7.07. So we had four extra seconds to kill it, uh, or should have, but it had a variable enrage. And then we ended up killing it like four hours later or something like that. After we had that wipe, that was fucking tragic. But that rate here was like really close back and forth. I mean, you had better Halandris, you killed Andam before us, then we kind of overtook a little bit. Yeah, you guys uh, played better on Rigalon and uh, Lords of Dread. What happened on Jailer? Because that was not the same liquid on that boss from uh, we've seen. Yeah. Was, uh... I think we just had a, we just had like a Menti B. Well, I mean, we were fine on it all the way up until like, like we were the first time we got to like, Sub 20% we were trading off. It was like one guild hit 20, the other hill guild hit 18, the other guild hit 16, the other guild hit 14. And then I think we got to 12% with our strat before ever changing it. And then we made some comp changes, which were like the worst thing ever. Like we regressed so hard. We, I think for an entire progression day, after even being in the lead at 12%, we had an entire progression day where we did not even get like sub 15. It was just like a full on boom. And as far as why, I think one thing you guys did that was actually pretty smart was you guys started sleeping more near the end. I think I heard like Zalea was like pretty like stern and like, yo, we need more sleep. You guys took that day off or most of a day off on Monday. We never did that. And we got to the event like a week before you guys. And I don't know if it's the same for you all or if you ever felt this at all. But like there was that feeling of like we have these 20 something people like 20 to 25 year olds that are living out of a hotel for at that point 30 days we had to move hotels like in the middle of the last week people were just kind of done with being where they were also the conditions were like i i didn't really talk about this a lot of the time because like i didn't really want to flame liquid too hard about it because like it was the last event in the entire a country space that we could get and like the last event we had was sick like obviously like the team liquid place was awesome but like we had to replace the catering multiple times people were getting sick we had like an hour or two of packet loss every day. All the internet IPs were public. Uh, multiple times the employee there was downloading a game like Elden Ring and it literally gave everyone 500 MS until we could find out who was doing it. <laughs> did he get fired? Man, no, oh no, he God. did this twice too. He did this twice. He the, <laughs> the, the food was literally garbage. Not only did it have to be replaced twice, but like it was just like always cold. People weren't eating the food that they were catering. We were walking and getting our own food which was obviously like super carb heavy and like, you know, people weren't eating right. Uh, there was like maintenance at one of the hotels. So like there, or there was like a loud, like soccer, people were like screaming all night in the hotel. It, and then I think more than anything, it was just being there for 30 days. It just seemed like people were so over what we were doing, but also just, I think we made a swap at the end of the thing and played really bad. And then we weren't going to recover from that. I always see like a lot of the, some of the liquid videos and you have like a personal chef and everything and the catering looks so good. Bro, we got mushrooms and tomato every single day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was so tired of our catering. Dude, the catering this yeah. time was banger. The really so good. fucking good. Yo, it was chef insane. Heidi. Yeah, this time, this time doing. pretty much everything was insane. We had a little bit of a uh, sickness outbreak. That was that was one thing that was not great this time. We had multiple people have to be separated due to illness. And like we had to like move people around. We had people raiding from like these random rooms. So that was like 
the only thing but everything else this time was just like perfect that that event space was awesome it was like just as good as complexities yeah jack had to he gave up his room so that raiders could yeah raid from Dude, the speaking, speaking of that the one super complicated thing this tier was splits and like how to trade gear so both our guilds figured this out we're like you do the runs you don't trade anything you have a spreadsheet handle all the loot and then you have it handed out and the guy who was micromanaging all of this was Bubba. This was his job for the tier. This shit was going to be him. He was going to figure it out, make it the most efficient. And then he gets gravely ill. It wasn't COVID. We don't know. You think it was like RSV or something. The day of splits, he's like barely able to be awake and do anything. And he's playing out of this room. Ben also got sick with the same thing on the same day and was just like playing out of a hotel room and I felt so bad because like he put months of work into it and he was just like a shell of a human. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, Scribe was handling most of that stuff together with some of the outside guys. But yeah, very convenient to have someone else. I know Scribe also said that the bit of someone that dedicated to do this stuff just does this. It's just hard to find the right person. I'm to too trust. stupid to do splits. That shit's way too complicated. You have a general idea for it, but that is it's the amount of like math and shit that went into that this time is crazy. What's the dynamic like in the guild? Like, uh, what the role do you take outside of like rate leading? How much input do you have in strategies, uh, group composition, things like that? That's that's my entire dynamic. I, I would say I would say even rate leading. I feel like as far as calling things every pull is like pretty minimal. Like I actually think that could be handled by other people. I would say my dynamic in the guild is entirely strat related. All the strat stuff is me or most of it are a team of people. Obviously it's a collaboration between a lot of people, but like that is my final decision making is like comp is my big thing, strat, and uh, I would say problem solving. I think that's the thing that's actually the most important is like not calling things is could be done by a lot of people. It's being able to see when things are wrong and finding a quick and good solution to it. A lot of the other stuff is kind of given to other people though. Like I think most of recruiting or at least like keeping an eye on talent is done by other officers. You know, the splits and farm done by other officers. Most of it is just creative problem solving during the raid. And uh, when, when group composition, that's like, uh, sounds like an easier job than it actually is. Like how do you keep yourself up to date with all of the classes, their strengths, weaknesses, um, especially with all of these new implementations into the game, you need to really be on it to really have make good decision making when it comes to that. Well, I feel like you have to still play the game and kind of understand it at your own level. Like, I don't think any one person, like I would not expect myself to play every single class in the game. Cause I know, especially like with ranged DPS and like, I'm not as good as ranged as melee. And then also, I don't heal and I haven't tanked in years. So I've always understood tanking because I've done it, but like I don't heal. So like healing, I pretty much, well, I don't know if I'm going to be doing this in the future, but like I just, I uh, delegate that to people, to our healers and our healing core to kind of decide healing composition. And then I just need to know basically what buffs are going to come out of healing or if we need them to run any buffs, but I don't, usually that's never a thing. My, my comp is almost entirely fixated on like DPS and tank compositions. And I feel like it's probably the same as your all's guild where there's no one like, master source of all information you just have to collaborate with people and you have to keep up to date on the strengths of every class and that's just talking being around a lot and talking with people especially during beta like you guys will notice through the rest of the expansion for the other people in the call the comps for things are going to be much more obvious for the rest of the expansion just like they were in uh just like they were in shadowlands it didn't really change after like the first season or two outside of some major nerfs because like beta and going into the first raid is like where the most things are new and you can have the most advantage by knowing that like clearly this raid healing was one of them right like our healers were off of evoker and clearly that was wrong and like going forward in the expansion you're not going to catch us or really anyone else underestimating evoker or a class that isn't being played at the moment yeah that's actually very interesting you say that because um evoker was a new class and from uh, what I've heard from many of the healers in our guild is that initially it's a very awkward healer and it takes some time to get used to and actually get the full use out of its strength. And we had a lot of our healers, they were like hard pumping Evoker on uh, on beta. Do you feel like uh, that's something that one of like your healers were missing or w what was the reason you I think do why... think I do think, yeah, that was a mistake. So I noticed that. So I noticed that your healers basically were just playing a ton of Evoker. The way we looked at testing and you guys looked at testing was a little different. I noticed you guys were basically forcing Evokers into comps just to get more information on them, which I think in hindsight was the better decision. What we did was 
let's take the healers that are currently the strongest and we're the best at right now so we see farther in testing to get farther and i think we did we, we killed i think we killed every boss that was tested on mythic and that was you know i we just felt like it was better to get farther in it but also the thing that made evoker so good was actually changed after testing was over and I think your guild saw that by playing it in testing and then being like, okay, well, if you can just add this to this, then like, okay, that this raid build is insane. I know like the change they made to Evoker that made them so good in raid was largely done after testing was over. So like our healers weren't playing the fuck out of it on beta. And that definitely, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is. We had a few healers. I mean, it's actually pretty divisive. We like maybe uh, and another one of our healers were like, very very high in evoker and wanted to play evoker all the time and the overall decision was that it, it's new and then also evoker like wouldn't have been quite good enough and then we saw pretty quickly that that is not true that's also why i started healing in farm or healing a little bit because i think i need to be in general that taught me that i needed to be more involved with like healer decision making i did think that was pretty uncanny though because this is literally the exact opposite of what happened last expansion, but just swapped guilds. Like I feel like last expansion, we were like super high on Venthyr Pally. And we were like, this is the fucking spec. This shit is so broken. You run two of these, they do so much damage. And then I think that definitely gave us an edge over you guys in Nathria. Like 100%. And then this raid, I feel like you're all's preparation of Evoker definitely... Yeah, Nathria <laughs> was cursed, bro. Also, our Boomkins went Kyrian. I mean, it was... Double shambles there. But your Boomkins went Kyrian for last boss? No, they went Kyrian for, like, back then we were kind of, like, you were hard locked into a Covenant. And, uh... Yeah, we did that, I too. Remember was, we, we, yeah. we, oh, we were... As well. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. yeah, yeah, Both yeah, yeah, yeah. Boomkins yeah, yeah. super hard. <laughs> okay, right. I, 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 I agree that it was, like, a somewhat int, but I think it actually made sense for the bosses we were doing. So Night Fae was better for sure on, like, uh, Denath uh, Denathrius and Sludgefist, but Kyrian was actually really good on Sludgefist because there was a really good one minute class at the time. I forget who it was. It was either Dima wasn't good yet, and Affliction was only good on one and four. It was uh, it was uh, Fire Mage. So Fire Mage had uh, combust and giga damage for every pillar. So we thought, but we paired up uh, Kyrian Moonkin with combust Fire Mage for pillars, mm -hmm. and it was actually pretty valuable. Like the the druids were doing overall less damage, but it was within like like very small amounts of DPS difference. And then we also wanted Kyrian for Stone Legion generals because Night Fae was just pretty dog shit on Stone Fe Stone Legion generals. So the plan was to be Kyrian for Sludge Fist and Stone Legion, and then go Night Fae for Denathrius, which I think was okay. I don't know if your druids stayed Kyrian the whole time, but I know that you could you could have like prepped a Night Fae swap for the second week, which is what we did on Donnie. You also had a different was it the Brot Warrior you played, I think that was also was yeah. a tank difference. Yeah. Yeah, we we knew that Arms was gonna be fundamentally the very like Arms Warrior wasn't amazing on Denathrius, but their design was amazing for it. They had Venthyr, you know, what was it called Condemn was perfect. You had Condemn to target cleave with execute uh in nope. all of P2, right? Uh, and then you had Condemn in P3, which was like perfect Arms Warriors percentage. So we were like, look, if Arms Warriors ever going to be good on this fight, if Arms Warriors tuned well at all, they will be like the best class for this. But right now, Arms Warriors tuning is dog shit. They were like really low tuned that raid in general. Each one of our guilds, I think, ran exactly one. And then we were like, okay, well, what's better this raid? I think it was, what were the tanks back then? It was, was it Vengeance Demon Hunter? And I don't even remember the other tank, but we basically just thought that outside of Vengeance Demon Hunter, which we had one of, we just thought that the rally was better than the other tank option. And it allowed us to sit warrior on the last boss if their tuning was bad, which was pretty close. I think we would have, you guys probably never sit Revis because he's so good. Like that guy's just goaded. But like, I think warrior was like very sittable on that fight. And that would have allowed us to still keep the buff basically. It's actually funny you say that because Revis was uh, topping the boss damage in last phase uh, when we looked at locks after uh, the kill we had. Yeah, and I know, I know, Kevin. If you include damage done to Remordium P two was decent, but I forget exactly what boss we were bringing. But like, because P two and P three damage. Did you guys ever cap your damage in P two? Like where you could not get any more boss damage out of P two. It just phased when it phased. I think I don't remember if we were holding damage towards the end because of cooldown timings because you know we were forcefully pushing it. I don't know. I don't remember if we got to that point ever, or if it was just pump, 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 get as low as possible, going to last phase. I don't remember how it was. It's been too long. 
but the so I, I couldn't say yeah i i know i know we were looking we were going to swap it out for similar last phase damage but better p2 damage to phase the boss like a percent lower or a two percent lower that was the swap yeah I don't, yeah, I don't remember if phase two damage mattered or... Um, I think near the very that. end, I think when both of our guilds were killing it, it stopped mattering. But also the decision to sit warrior was something we weren't going to necessarily do on the fight. It was like a before the raid thing. It was like before the raid, if we want to bring warrior, but it's possible this class gets set. Which is kind of crazy because like arms warrior was literally perfect for that fight. Also, we thought that prot warrior execute would have been really, really good on that fight in the last phase. Uh, but you just ended up taking way too much damage to make good use out of it. Like, Prot Warrior execute single target in BFA was actually really fucking good. Yeah, those two tiers you guys did. I mean, that and also, I mean, Nihilofa, I think that was the one tier where we lost with the biggest margin out of all of them. That was uh, not a fun tier for us. That was also the first time you went outside fully, I remember. We're still having Raid's leader playing. I don't know if that was the biggest impact. I think there was also some mistakes we made uh, in other parts, but... Uh, what do you think, like, was the biggest reason Nihilotha? why there was a jump? Um, yeah, Nihilofa. So outside the raid, raid leading was good. The only thing I have with it having the biggest impact is I think of when outside the raid, raid leading had the biggest impact in that raid. And I think it was definitely Ilganoth. I think Ilganoth was the raid where you needed, like, someone micromanaging that entire fight for the way that we killed it. Which, by the way, I fucking loved that fight. I know a lot of people hate Ilganoth. Because they did the, like, no dispel strat. But I think the way we killed that boss in progression, I think us and pieces, I think, also did it. was, like, super, super fun um, and very challenging. But the thing is, is Roger was outside the raid on that fight also doing my exact role of calling every single dispel and, like, doing that. So I don't know if, like, we both had the same outside the raid, raid leading situation on Ilganoth. And then also the boss where we outplayed you guys and everyone else the most. Like, the boss with the biggest difference was Drestigath. And I was in the boss on that. I, I was raid leading from in. I sat now on purpose because I felt like that was just a fight that was very YOLO'd and you just needed someone in the raid marking and telling people where to go near the end. And then I played that boss. So like the two bosses where we did really well, there wasn't really a difference in outside the raid raid leading. We either both had one or we neither had one. I think that was just, I, don't, I think tank damage difference mattered a lot. Like I noticed that our tanks were like fucking cranking damage with corruption, and I don't know if that was happening in your all's guild as much, but I haven't looked too deep into that. I mean, Drestigaf, I 100% agree. So like uh, we came in there and um, you guys copied our strat, we right? Were, That's what. Well, we were trying to we were trying to like look at what you guys did and try to like rocket science it, make an idea out of it. In hindsight, you. Should, you would be better off not seeing anything yeah just pressing w and hitting yeah because that's what we did you. that i that's found that so funny i talked to roger about this and he told me that like you guys had a mage trial that like while you guys were killing some other boss he just wrote down every single thing we did and when we pushed bosses and why and then like you guys just basically copy pasted it which makes sense for people who are listening like this happens all the time oftentimes you may have a strat set out for a boss even though dressed is a very weird strat boss but like you may have a strat set out and then, like, another guild kills it, and there's not a real reason. It's time inefficient to try to do something different than something you know already works. So a lot of the times, even if it doesn't look great, you just do something that someone else did. So that's what they try to do with ours. But our strat, I still to this day do not know how Drestigath works. I just marked things that looked good to kill, and then we just kind of made it work. And then we killed it, like, pretty decently fast and had, like, a nice burn at the end on our last, uh, at the end of the fight. So if someone was trying to copy that exact YOLO, it's just going to be like, dude, this is just worse than, like, planning it out. <laughs> so, but it was just kind of like a YOLO boss. It was weird. I don't know why. That, yeah. I don't know why we killed that boss so fast. I genuinely don't. Yeah, we were just stuck on it, trying to uh, overcomplicate it. Wait, didn't that same uh, thing that was... happen this raid? I think I heard that, like, you guys um, on Dathia, you got to Dathia, and you basically tried to, like, copy the amount of people or healers we were sending up or something. And it ended up hurting you because yeah. we spent we spent all of progression on that fight trying to kill the boss with like only four elementals instead of five. So we were like under healing and we were, you know, trying to go as far as we can. And then we didn't really change our strat when they nerfed it because we were just able to kill it right away. So like if you were to approach the boss after all those nerfs for the first time, you would have went in with just more healers or been safer. And I think that's what you guys went through, right? Yeah, that. We had the people dying on the platforms due to lack of healing. That was one thing. And that was super frustrating. Especially, you know, you can look at a at a death. And you can look at a as a DPS player. 
and be very analytical about your personal cooldowns. But there's nothing more frustrating than when you die pressing your personals how they're planned out and then you still die. And that happened True. a lot. That happened a lot in uh, on that fight and that normally doesn't happen very often. Uh, and that was very frustrating because that's the first time I've actually felt like there was a lack of healing and I could do nothing about it. Uh, so that was a little bit annoying, um, 100%. And then there was, we tried to do like a weak aura for I don't know how long and the weak aura kept breaking. It was super frustrating Dude. and I was against like a weak aura in that fight. Dude, just need a the good same lead. thing happened and to us. Holy fuck, continue, sorry. I just, it literally the exact same feeling. And that, that was something I was against. Like, I didn't never felt like we needed a weak arrow for this mechanic. We just needed a scribe to call, uh, and that was it. And that's what we went with, and it worked out super well. We, we had this happen on Kurog, where we had an absolute and total weak aura fucking meltdown. Like, just nothing worked. It was just everything, just the simple weak auras didn't work. It was like a when it rains, it pours situation. Like, assigning absolute zero sides with a weak aura. And dude, we were just wiping to the weak auras, just not working. And then we eventually were so off of it that we were like, dude, fuck weak auras, full natty, and we just killed the boss. We were just like, dude, fucking forget healer reminders, just call out healing CDs, we'll natty call absolute zero soaks because nothing's working, and then we just killed it. And it was the most, like, I think you probably feel this way as well, where, like, two things are true. You can use a weak aura to help make yourself, in the short term, much better. And use it to remind you and use it for anything you can. You want you want weak auras to support you to where you can be as good of a damage and staying alive player as possible and remove everything else if you can. But over time that like removes your that makes your awareness worse over years of time, for sure. Because you are teaching yourself in the in the sake of being optimal in a short term scenario, which is in a race, you make everything that's that separates a good pro player between a great player handled by a computer, you know? And that is something where on that fight i got so frustrated with it because i'm just like dude three years ago old ass yolo limit we would have killed this boss like an hour ago just never fucking with this shit at all and just just spreading out and figuring it out and that that boss fucking bugged me so much i fucking hate weak auras man like I, i'm fine with like reminder weak auras i just think any weak auras that like where people are reliant on them and they're just so fucking easy to do on their own even though it's technically better to have it be automated it's just so fucking frustrating. I just, I just wish you could just play the game. Yeah, it's important to know when that is as well. I remember we had this super complicated uh, week or uh, for dreadlords uh, trying to deal with the the mechanic of uh, spreading the debuffs. Because uh, mm. yeah, in case you give a debuff to someone uh, wrong, then it's an instant death. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the later fights, right? That's what we expected going into the fight, and the mechanic just ended up being like super easy. And the only thing that you needed to do was not get hit by the green poop, right? That mechanic was just completely uh, gone. It only became a problem if people just kept getting hit. Uh, so sometimes, I mean, that was a pre-progress thing, so it didn't really matter. But I do think there's some situations where we're trying to overcomplicate um, over some strategies and we're trying to weaker ourselves out of it. And especially these complicated weakers, a lot of times, they just take too long to uh, get perfect. Yeah. <laughs> the fear was one of them. Yeah, the feeling, the feeling of being able to progress a fight and having your entire raid chomping at the bit to pull it and kill it and having to sit there and wait, wait for weak auras to be made or fixed is definitely one of the worst experiences I ever have in raid. That and uh, I think the only thing that ever makes me mad in raid and tilts me actually, like I, I'll never get tilted to wiping except for one thing. If there is a problem to solve or something you could do on that pull and talk about to make better the next pull, I'm happy. I'll, I'll wipe forever because that just means you're getting better. However good you are, you're getting better every pull. When you feel like there's nothing else to figure out and people are just like inting to things you figured out a long time ago, that is the worst feeling of all time. I and I can't hide it either. It's like you're just you're just fucking mad, man. Like I it just shouldn't happen. I think that's every raid leader's weakness. Yeah, it's fucking it's so rough, man. Oh, sorry. You guys are just here listening to us talk about raid shit for like. Oh, an this hour. is a great podcast, actually. Yeah, no, we're just chilling. <laughs> just chilling. How do players in Liquid deal with the uh, like their individual performance and optimizations when it comes to uh, optimizing their personals, offensive CDs, uh, looking back at certain things, uh, personal reminders, stuff like that? How how do you usually uh, do those things? Is that just up to the individual I person's think... responsibility, or is there support uh, internally? From my 
there's definitely support internally. There are analysts who that is like kind of their job, at least to support in that. Like, I think usually how it works is, you know, let's just say Shakib wants a timer for his blurs in P1. And he's like, yo, I've been blurring at the same time in P1. I did just like a reminder for this one. He would just like message that to someone and it would be done for him. So like, I guess there's that kind of support for any kind of reminder, I guess, during the raid. Um, I think we use very similar reminder systems. It's like you basically just have them input it and then we have we both have a program that puts that into your weak auras automatically. So you're good there. And then I think it's just I think it's mostly personal, right? It's like when you have small breaks or there's downtime in between pulls, that's the time for you to like kind of go back and watch a pull of you doing this and be like, oh, I could I could do that here. Um, you know, actually this is really interesting and I noticed this this raid, is I think you guys do this all the time. You guys wake up and you guys look at our like like what you probably watch a pov of like what someone who's playing your class in our guild is doing just for literally any small thing that could be good what's really interesting is we don't do that for you guys ever and it's for a reason it's because when you're like starting ahead and you know that like you're going to enter mythic first you're going to probably kill most of the like middle to like near the end bosses first looking at your all's just stream is a distraction it is literally a distraction you're learning nothing you've already done that Right. So to prevent tilt and things like that, us watching your all's content, it can only tilt us if you kill a boss like faster than we think you're going to kill it or something or um, whatever. Like it literally makes no sense. But because of that, we kind of like don't look at your all's shit ever because in that way it can only be negative. But that's not true on an end boss. We're always going to be on an end boss at the same time. And I think we could have looked at what you guys were doing more once we got to the boss and looked more through POVs in the past because of that. And it's interesting because if you guys watch their shit, like they probably have frequently watched POVs or watch what we are doing, but it makes sense because them watching us is because they're behind and they're learning things that will potentially help them. So like the dynamic is really, really different where like the psychology of going first and like almost feeling rushed like, you don't want to fall behind, because you shouldn't, I guess. Even though it'll naturally always happen when you sleep. is much different than starting behind, where you know you just have to be as efficient as possible and know that you're going to catch up, or hope that you catch up. I just think that's something that's, like, super weird. It's, it's funny you say that. Do you think, like, the dynamic in the guild changes uh, once you get there behind for the first time? 100%. Because, because statistically speaking, we have never lost a tier against you guys as soon as we get ahead. You have never caught up again. Um... And do you feel like that's because... That's not true. Um, uh, in Castle Nathria, in Castle Nathria, at the end of the first week, you guys were at like 26% or something like that. And we were at 35 while we were doing our reclear. In... Was it... Or oh, the Nathrius. Yeah, yeah, the Nathrius. Yeah, we were never oh, okay. we were never behind in Nazoth. Yeah, we were we were like a day and a half to two days ahead that whole raid. But that, also, they weren't streaming their POVs. True. So there was no potential for any of that back then. Yeah, so, but yeah, I mean, like, cool. even then, though, like, they were literally, when they turned their stream back on again, they were literally ahead. Like, they were ahead of us. So, like, that, yeah, they, they, uh, so that has happened it once. Luck, I think, right? But, but uh, something like that, I remember. Well, to answer your question, though, there is a difference. Um, I think it depends on the situation. And I think this time we were not. In fact, that was a big point of emphasis going into this raid was, hey, guys, in every single raid we go up against these guys, at some point, they're going to pass us because no matter what, whether we start a full day ahead of you guys, whether I think this raid in between maintenances, we started four hours ahead of you guys, I think, uh, with you guys starting 12 hours behind and then eight hours of maintenance, no matter what, we could start two days ahead of them. At some point, we are going to sleep and they're going to have more efficient time and they're going to pass us. The inevitability of Echo passing us is there. And the same thing for you guys. You guys know, and you probably train yourself to know that when you go to sleep, you know you're going to wake up and we're going to be ahead of you. And you have to go, you have to show up to the event and know that you're going to play well and pass us as well. Right? You can't, like, let that affect you. But for your all's team, I think it's different. I'll get into that in a second. And it's because, like, you're you're built in, from the very beginning, you're used to being behind. It's not a new feeling. You don't have to, like, work on that feeling. For us, I know that the psychology of it is that you feel rushed. And in the past, we have definitely... The vibe of our raid when we're in the lead versus when we just initially lose the lead is very different. Um, and I think in the past, that was also a little bit on me. Like, I felt that. However, I feel the entire rest of the raid will feel. That's always been true. And that was something we really focused on this raid. So this raid, I don't think it affected us at all. Like, we, I mean, we literally didn't look at it. That was kind of the whole point, was do not look at what they're doing and only focus on us. And I think that did hurt us a little bit on Razageth because I think our players 
looking through your all's POVs would have actually like gained some insight and like, you know, just different ideas. Two heads are better than one kind of thing. Oh, this guy's popping this there kind of thing. Do you actually have like a zero tolerance to like, uh, or, zero. Uh, to like actually what? Okay. Yep. We okay. did not watch your all's POVs ever as players. They were not allowed to do that. And the, the, and, and the reason why is because we tilted because of that in Sepulchre. Like specifically the way that Anduin went down, like a lot of people will remember the Anduin thing. That thing was like pretty, yeah, pretty that was controversial. Also partly on me. And uh, apparently they were doing some bad acting, like Liquid that is, because you can clearly see That's here. You're talking, Mike. This guy doesn't give a fuck. Oh, I'm muted. Are we uh, sending it all? He just doesn't give a fuck. And Max is like saying, "Oh, mm -hmm. watch stars." Like they're trying to hide it or something. Oh, I, I'm, I. I I said something I shouldn't have back then, uh, of course. I know I tilted you specifically uh, for uh, like quite a long time uh, after the Anduin thing. But uh, yeah, I also I got heated in a moment. You know, I, you're very passionate. I remember uh, what's it called THD had a similar thing after Castle Nafria screaming, fuck Echo. Come on. Yes, blood. That's yeah! it. Yes! Fuck you! Let go! You know, like, it's just, uh, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't hate everyone in the guild uh it's just you know when you're in it well for what it's worth i don't think anyone passionate. know why Jinji or why why thd did that <laughs> like thd <laughs> is just weird like he's just like a fucking weirdo like like we saw that clip and we're like why the fuck did you do that <laughs> like he doesn't dislike echo at all he's just like a fucking weirdo but yeah he uh yeah the end one thing happened and then obviously very tilted to that um and then we go to the next boss and we are just doing to, it just to completely close that one by the way uh did you guys actually not know about it when you killed it that the balls were not working no you didn't hide it you, it was just of course not brand. no just... okay okay yeah so that, I'll, that was the first I'll, bullet that happened. was the first pull it ever happened yeah so I'll, I'll i'll explain how it worked we got to that boss and for a while in p3 were you guys in p3 when we were in p3 i don't remember if you guys had a p3 think... pull or not I don't remember. Maybe we've okay. seen it like a so, or something. Phase two was the hard part. So in there. fact, maybe someone in my guild, if they're listening, I don't know if they are, could could actually link me. We have clips of this. The divine stars were fucking huge in P3. They were killing you from like five yards away from their animation. Like it had to be fixed. People were just dying all the time to stars that were nowhere near them. And we were basically just waiting on this fix to continue progressing. It was like you basically had to be guessing where the divine star animation was. It was just like three to four times as big as it should have been. And it wasn't, it's it, it's the same Divine Star an animation that was in the first phase, I guess just different spell ID, they got the, the spell size wrong, whatever. So we had been used to that. So when we got into that last phase on the pull that we killed it, we weren't getting hit by them, but people didn't know they weren't getting hit by them because we just knew that their hitbox was infinitely smaller. Like as soon as someone didn't die from them going like two yards to the left of them, they were like, oh, they fixed it. So we didn't tell the difference between them not being overly big to them not hitting at all. Like the fix they made was they just made either impossible or extremely hard for them to actually kill you. And then it was basically we were just focusing on the kill. Uh, but then we watched it afterwards. And actually, I think it was within like 10 seconds of us killing the boss. One of our healers was like, yo, those things weren't hitting us at all, right? Like they were just like, they realized like during the pull, but they weren't going to say it during the pull. They're like, yo, those things like, I got hit by one of those things. It didn't do any damage to me. But like you're less likely to see or feel that because you were so used to getting hit by the bigger ones that, you know, if one went by you, you were just like, oh, whatever. So that was basically that. And then we killed it. And then we watched some POVs and we're like, oh, those things were like turbo not working. But that actually really went against our favor. We were really ahead on that boss. <laughs> and then, that, and, it, yeah, and then it, true. it fucked us. The reason why it was so yeah. tilting was because we were so ahead and so like, like genuinely that boss is dead within like five P3 pulls with those things hitting you or not. We wouldn't have killed at that pull. Multiple people would have died to those things, including the tanks at the end. But that boss was very close to dead and it would have been a lot of learning or obviously more learning for you guys. So the thing that tilted us the most was the fact that Blizzard fucked it up like that. And then we killed the boss, went to Lords of Dread, and then we see you guys completely change your P3 strat. And then all you have to do is just fucking stand still and never move for anything because you know that it would be unfair for them to like fix the balls at that point. So we're like, oh, what the fuck? So now they get to like, you know, instantly catch up basically. And then Lords of Dread was a combination of a few things, but I think it was a failure on my part of allowing people in our guild to feel that way. Because you have to keep in mind what had happened to us previous in the raid. I'm glad we taught ourselves this for this raid because Sepulchre, we kept running into bosses that had to be nerfed. We got to 
live of them and it had to be nerfed insane and then not only did they nerf it they like changed our strat and like some weird shit and then we went back and killed it you get to Halandris, you know they have to nerf the fuck out of it. You get to Anduin, they nerf the fuck out of it like three times. And then you get to Lords of Dread, the fourth boss in a row, and it's like, okay, fucking here we go again. Now, the reality is it was killable. And in fact, there's actually a a message that I sent to Blizzard. I could maybe scroll back and find it, but the gist of it is, are you guys sure about this Enrage? We would have to kill this boss probably 20 to 30 seconds into the Enrage currently to kill it. Which obviously shows that we knew it was killable going into the Enrage. We just assume, hey... The last four bosses are overtuned as fuck and had to be nerfed. I really doubt Blizzard intentionally wants you to kill a boss 20 seconds past their enrage. You know, enrage is like a pretty normal thing that like is showing you where they think the fight should end, I guess. And I'm telling them that their damage is off again. And it's like, okay, well, we don't know if they're going to fix it, but we know we have to learn two bosses now and we can go to either one. Do we spend the last three hours of our raid going to Rygalon or spending more time on Lords of Dread when it's possible? that they nerf it tomorrow. Not saying it was unkillable, just they might nerf this because they just nerfed four bosses in a row that were also overtuned. So that was what we did. We went and spent some time on Rigalon, but because of that, people in our guild were so fed up with us doing four bosses in a row that needed heavy nerfs. They were just like, dude, this is so unfun. Why can't they just fucking tune this game properly? And a few of them put out some really cringe tweets about like being like, this is so fucking annoying basically, which it was annoying, but like, it showed weakness. And then we went and did Rigalon, and we learned a lot about Rigalon that set us up for the next day. But then we woke up and you guys killed Lords of Dread after they tweeted that cringe shit. And you could tell in your all's mentality, and I don't, you could maybe confirm if this is true. I think you guys seeing those tweets really fueled you. It was like, oh, these guys think this fucking boss is unkillable, which wasn't true. We didn't actually think that, but like those guys were just popping off. And like, oh, these I guys mean, think this boss is unkillable? That's, this boss is definitely killable, yeah, fuck them. I I mean, part of competition and progress, of course, without being toxic, is also a little bit of the mental aspect, right? You get the momentum when you see your other competitor a little bit down, it fuels you. Uh, of course it does. Um, but I'm the type of person that if it's flame or if someone talks shit to me or whatever, bro, I don't give a fuck. I would assume that you also be, okay, if you have a tilt moment, you go out, get some fresh air, you come back in, energized, and you get this, you know, the raid leader vibe. Because you, your impact uh, and the way you speak in the raid, everything it affects the whole fucking guild and that's super important right uh, you cannot tilt even you, you cannot be human you just need to shake it off that's yep. super important and uh, you don't strike me as the type to be tilted for like a full day Why, what was the difference there wait on on which on lords of dread on uh, yeah yeah exactly for, going from android to lots of dread you well, have, like, specific a, there the longest uh... tilt moment <laughs> i've ever seen from you uh yeah that was because of you <laughs> i was <laughs> You tilted me off the fucking face of the earth. I don't know why it fucking made me so mad that... Okay, it was actually two things. I'll, I'll keep it a fucking buck. This is exactly what made me mad. You obviously got mad in the heat of the moment, and you were like, dude, these guys are fucking faking that these things aren't working. Like, clearly they're fucking... They're going through you. And then I saw that, and I'm like, dude, that, that just fucking sent me to the Shadow Realm initially, but that's not what actually did it. It's the fact that you rightfully realized that that was fucking wrong and then you tweeted you know oh you know by the way sorry i said this shit whatever and then i looked through the replies on this tweet and it's just like oh fucking good guy gingy fucking oh this guy what up i mean what a guy you know <laughs> just i mean you got this guy on i mean Twittered? i mean that's the reason um, you got i mean dude guy, this guy this guy is egg? so this guy's so humble he's just oh he apologized it's like what do you mean he fucking caused all of this like, the, the amount of parasocial, jobless viewers that came into my chat for the rest of that day saying just the most ridiculous shit, and it was just because he said that for no goddamn fucking reason. And then at the end of that, I have to uh, look at Twitter. So yeah, basically, uh, Twitter and that uh, lived rent-free in my head for at least an entire day. Um, and... and uh, and then, uh, and then, yeah, that's why uh, looking at Twitter and uh, Twitch is now hard banned at all of our events. So, <laughs> oh my god, oh. went after the meant to be. <laughs> yeah, fuck that, oh man. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> no, but like, I was just, uh, of course, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Dude, you <laughs> could, you could, you, could, you could, like, you feel bad about it, but you like, you impacted your team's chance to win inadvertently or not in that raid. Like, you fucking yeah, sent a warfare. Yeah, you fucking sent me off the goddamn cliff. So that was that was definitely real. 
uh, it was we were over it by Rygalon, and we had a good, you know, good time on Jailer. But yeah, specifically, I think that was a pretty impactful point in the race. Was that, and that is something. I mean, I I would like to say that's actually something that I'm really good at normally. That's why the Anduin thing is weird because I'm like kind of known for someone who doesn't really like I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I am. You will never see me be fake happy, fake mad. That does not happen. I am exactly who I am at all times. But. I stay very productive and I don't tilt in raids. I used to. I'd like teach myself not to. It's very easy as a raid leader to get mad at everything that isn't going your way, right? But if you understand people are human, make mistakes and are getting better, like you don't get mad as long as you're problem solving. But dude, that that fucking broke me. That was the first time in probably two raids I tilted, hard tilted. I like I, I can't think of a single time in this raid that just happened where I uh tilted, really. But that yeah, you fucking you broke my you you were living rent free for like an entire twenty four hours. Oh gosh, oh yeah, I was just surprised that the you know back then seeing it, I thought things like that you would just be like, yeah, we're fucking idiots, and then well, you know, move on. Kind I of, think it, kind of I thing. think it struck a special chord. I played Final Fantasy a bit in that previous season. Oh no, and oh shit, running into people in that game was the most cringe thing I've ever dealt with. We did like these blind raids <sighs> with some friends. Yeah. And I, since I remember now, yeah, you got a lot of like community negative dude. feedback in back to back to back. So uh, yeah, and specifically oh, the main one, yeah. which like kind of picked up. If it was a lot of things at first, they hated me because I was the add-on guy, and then I was the they're very against add-ons in that game. And then rotations blind. Uh, yeah, testing. yeah, <laughs> and then so so then eventually they start like saying that we were doing blind progression, but not really. Like we wanted to like show off, I guess. So. Instead of doing real blind progression, we were just like looking up guides and we were all like in cahoots together and shit. So that shit happened and that tilted the fuck out of me. Cause if anything, I can be a lot of things, but I'm definitely like never not real with my chat or with my stream. I'm always doing something that is, I think like pretty honest and genuine and I, and I don't really make shit up. So that specifically like struck a chord with me and then the raid right after that. Oh, and then there's also another thing too. So Echo started, got the idea of doing the blind raids from me and then started doing it. And then Echo started becoming like the team Ooh. that they root for because they're like, oh, this is the real blind progression or whatever the fuck. Group. And then, and then, and then all that shit, right? So like, I know all these people, all these like cringe weirdos in that community are Echo fans. So I'm like, okay. So then this happens to Echo from us. And the insuation is that we were cheating on purpose and not talking about it and lying about it, like the dishonesty and lying about it. So I think if I'm being 100% honest, the reason why that specifically tilted me that much was a culmination of a lot of things. Yeah, I remember there was a guy that literally made a YouTube video calling you out. And I think Dude, that yeah, one I kind of blew up as well. Sick. <laughs> yeah, sick. basically the claim at the end of all of that is like, because most of those things they said that I came up with as well were like things that Nagura and other people came up with. They weren't even my strats. They were like other people's ideas that they were claiming as evidence that we looked up these fights ahead of time, like certain things that like the party finder did. The end of all of it was everyone in our group was cheating, but you know, we were like keeping it quiet or like certain people were and other people weren't. But the idea of like eight people on that many hours on stream, keeping all of that quiet and also none of them thinking that me or anyone else was looking up guides. It was just a very weird dynamic, but it, it basically just stemmed from as soon as I started playing, I was the only person streaming with add-ons, and there was clearly a target. It was like, we don't fucking like this guy. Something about him. Don't like him. And even before this, there was like 10 other things that there was so many Reddit posts about, like, this guy's doing this. They they blamed Jfunk for cheating and using a mod no, no, on E4S was the boss. They blamed because he sounded like a robot when he opened his mic. There's a literal, <laughs> there is a Reddit post of people thinking we were using a voice to speech thing because they assumed when he said fourth quadrant oh, yeah, I remember that. fourth quadrant that he sounded like dude it was anything it was literally anything they could throw at me well they think it was direction. like some sort of like big wigs or something it was really j funk yeah yeah they thought yeah yeah so his name was that for a while but yeah so just back to the anduin thing that was a culmination of a lot of stuff i think to tilt me that hard i mean that's understandable well, it's I not understandable. I mean, I still shouldn't do it. Like, it's embarrassing that I did it. Like, like allowing yourself, knowing how much my my ability to solve problems and also my attitude matters to the guild, allowing that to ever hurt us 
is like that can't happen right regardless of the situation yeah. so i mean like obviously like i'll i'll never look back on that positively but um but it's understandable yeah. that you care right like you're also a person you're a streamer and like uh, community feedback and criticism can be like a tilting thing but uh, like you said yourself as well a lot of these people that were against you were also a lot of echo fans uh my viewers doing the progress as well probably gone in and like tried to troll you a lot uh you know as much as they did just want to get under your skin you know as much as possible um oh yeah it's it's led me it's led me I... right it's just about not letting like that negativity like be the focus and skip past all of the positivity right because i mean there's a lot of that too you just saw all of the uh max is not a uh, fake blind uh, testing you know blah 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 uh, they knew about the anduin whatever the fuck it is Fuck yeah, that that, shit. that's why it's hard for me, I think, as this is kind of weird. I feel like when Echo gets a lot of hate towards you guys for whenever that is, um, it's directed to your main channel because your main channel gets the most viewers. I think yeah. one and weird and actually you used to have the most viewers, I think, when your all's channel was still getting off the ground. I forget what rate it was. So maybe you can actually relate to this a little bit. Uh, but for us, it's always been my channel. Obviously, that's good. Well, we split a lot of our money from the race or most of it. But if someone in Echo wants to say some fuck, if some Echo fan wants to say some crazy shit, they're not saying it in the Team Liquid channel where no one's looking. They're saying it to me. And they say it to me all year round because I stream all year round. So it's created this very weird dynamic where I don't talk to Echo people a lot. To give myself motivation to compete against you guys, I also need to like, you know, you, you probably do that to get an edge sometimes. You know, you're just like, oh, you know, fuck these guys. You do that to, that can give you an, an advantage in like your vigorousness in your preparation and then the only interaction i have with people from echo is seeing what their fans say to either me and my dms or me and uh my chat and it definitely helps me prepare because like but it also can like turn you into the joker <laughs> where like you don't have any interaction with another team and all you do is build motivation off of seeing what their fans say and if you don't have any conversations with people in their guild you really start to you know kind of just assume that a lot of that stuff comes from what they say as well, you know? Like, I, I think I think a lot of, like, bad takes I see from your all's viewers definitely uh, are somewhat... Like, especially, like, the 24-hour difference thing. That shit... That shit gets me good. It gets me fucking good. The... the Maybe like, this isn't a star drama, but I feel like... I don't... I can't think of any time that Echo's gotten hate. Yeah, like, I was what, what's, the last, what's the last thing TG, that like, people have hated Echo on? I, I, the biggest thing was uh, the TGP thing. Like, did you guys get a lot of shit for that? Uh, the, the plague boars only from china yeah. oh so surprisingly not a lot then i guess yeah i know astro wise uh, fans were like uh, kind of like they were really yeah. tilted about this but uh everyone just sees, that, uh, really. uh, yeah everyone's about tgp everyone still remembers back to that as like next level strat or whatever i know? think like, i have a theory the, I have a theory for why this is based on what growl said and you guys tell me if you think i'm wrong i'm not positive that i'm right it's just what i think might be true Fans of our guild and fans of me specifically, which I think a lot of those things correlate. I'm like a very, like, I would like to think that I go on my stream and I just am myself. I'm like pretty, I like pretty honest about stuff, like about me. It's not talk about stuff I normally wouldn't. I like keep the, the viewers into it. And like, basically, I think that promotes a fan base of people that do not have like a parasocial relationship with me because like I'm pretty self-deprecating. I as well as our guild you know we just keep really i think i think it's the opposite the more honest you are and the more like you know what i mean well here's really, what i noticed I, I always thought that was the opposite so like, the more yeah. down to earth and like honest you are and like the more relatable you are the more likely it is for people to get weird maybe. oh maybe. he's a champion of this maybe civilians. i mean you guys yeah you maybe know the one thing i've noticed with uh Gingy's fans which i think a lot of Gingy fans are also hardcore echo fans Gingy, do you remember when you got sat was it in sepulcher uh, yeah, the, I was playing Hunter and we sat the Hunter and Last of Us. Okay, do you remember what happened in your all's chat when that happened? At least from what I heard, it sounded like your fans were literally fucking slandering Echo in their main channel and like getting yeah. actually mad. I can see that. Yeah, okay. Getting okay. actually that mad actually. that you were not in the raid. Like they were like, what the fuck are you doing? Bring Jinji into the raid kind of thing. Yeah, it's true. I had to tell these fuckers like, you're not my fan if you play my teammates. Like this is yeah. a decision. <laughs> okay. Like, so what are you guys doing? So that was a really interesting thing. And I, I actually think that's kind of significant because I don't think that could possibly fucking happen to our guild. There's no player or me or anything where they could be left out of something and then the the fans of that person would like act like that right even though it's against your will you're not uh, a, you're not asking I, them I to act like one. this 
And like door game name one, what do you think? Wait, what would you say? I missed it. A person that would go into the liquid chat and like be pissed if they got sat. Uh, their community. Yeah, Jinji, when Jinji got sat on the last two bosses of Sepulchre, yeah. all of his fans are like in his chat. I think there's one person. Like people are mentioning fired up in JPC outrage. because they stream, but there's absolutely no oh, way. Not fired up. Definitely JPC though. Yeah, I was thinking JPC. Oh, it's, it's not, I'm not saying at all. It's JPC's yeah. Fault, oh, uh, maybe, way, maybe, yeah. Uh, he, he's got some fans is all i'm saying yeah but what i'm saying is i yeah, think that to act like that it's two things it's obviously like i think it's pretty parasocial and it's like a very deep emotional bond to the streamer but i also think it's passion level and i think the passion level of european fans in general there's not a lot of american video game fans that are nearly as passionate about esports or even sports in their country that is close to what is true in Europe in a lot of cases, especially the poorer parts of Europe with their local football teams. The level of fandom, it just means something different. It's deeper. Um, oh yeah, most NA people don't give a shit. Um, World of Warcraft, like the closest thing in NA might be like SEC football fandom or something like that. But I mean, it's nothing close to, to Europe. And, and I think it's that feverish fandom and the kind of parasocial bond with the streamer that makes them like that. Dude, after this raid, man, I felt some, some ways about the raid. I didn't say shit to anyone i didn't re i wasn't on twitter for an entire month i didn't see what anyone else said i hated the way it ended but there was no fucking no, way i was gonna that, talk about way, it even that because you don't say anything you get criticism for not being a good sport by the way like it doesn't matter what you yeah, do <laughs> but there's nothing to do i couldn't do anything like i there uh, yeah and that that to be honest that part of it to me kind of makes me hate the race it is literally the most fun thing that i do like, I love, it's the creative challenge of dealing with this is like super, super awesome. And I love my teammates. We have such a good vibe, stuff like that. But man, man, do I wish if it didn't mean sacrificing 20 people's paychecks, I'd go back to doing this shit off stream and just hanging out with your boys in a heartbeat. The extra shit that has come with this being televised is really shitty for me. And I don't like dealing with it at all. And it makes me not actually look forward to these races because it's the only time of the year that I have to deal with these people. I don't talk about the race outside of today. I literally do not talk about the race on my stream ever, even though it's probably the biggest thing on my stream year round, but it's not what my stream is about and it's not what I do. I literally fucking hate it. That's, uh, that's a good point. Like, yeah. because uh, I think both our streams right now, we're like both in the same position that I think the race was first has done so much for our streams, even outside of the race. So it has had a lot of positive effect uh, on our day to day streams nowadays. Some people would say that it fuels the race more, the entertainment, that you have this NA EU clash, but the... It's the only reason it has viewers. Some... You realize if yeah. we were both EU or both NA that the viewership would... I mean, I don't even know what it would be, but it would be insanely low. It, I, I, think, I think the region rivalry drives a huge part of the viewership for sure. But it's also the extremely negative part that makes me not want to do it at all. I mean, that's basically League of Legends for me, like... Yeah. If, when it's just uh, Korea winning every single time, I don't mm. really. I'm not very invested in mm. League of Legends. But but the, that's where I feel a little bit different. That negativity that you feel, I don't see it coming my way. Maybe it's because uh, you get more of it on your stream. Maybe uh, it there's more of it on the Echo main channel. But like because it's being, I'm not sure how good your moderators are doing a job, but like being really on point of. Uh, on everything, but it's like cast. You're just sitting there, you're rate leading, and you're not really focused on the stream, right? But like all of the viewership, all of the hate gets directed towards your channel. But there's literally no place for it in the Echo main channel. So maybe we don't really see it so much on our side. And all of our players, like we don't even have our chat open. We don't see that shit. Uh, so maybe you are like one of the only ones that really feel it. Well, it's not even during the race. I don't look at my chat during the race. My mods ban the fuck out of anyone who's super toxic during the race, even to the point where mm. sometimes ac people accidentally get banned for typing like normal yeah, shit. I remember that guy. Like someone will just yeah. come into my stream and just get banned for being like fucking EU best. And <laughs> they just get fucking banned forever because the two people around them were like, you fucking clown American fat fuck or just whatever the fuck they say, <laughs> you know? And like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what happens, right? It's just, it's not during the race. Cause I don't look at it during the race. It's what I have to hear outside of the race, like us getting disparaged for like coming in second or something. And while playing really well, like last raid, like that Menti B happened at the end, we played fucking insane last raid up until the last boss. And this raid, we played really, really well. We played really well in the last three raids that we've lost. There hasn't been a time where like 
we weren't close. We were doing really good. Let's look at the random person who who uh, who's in the MDI this week and comes in second in this tournament. They don't win. They come in second. What kind of flame and hate do you think those people get? Nothing. They get grats, actually, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And grats and going to globals, bro. Bro, bro, what what kind of what kind of hate and slander does the mm -hmm. guild who comes third in the race get? Yeah, but, I mean, it's of course. Uh, it's, it, it's it's different it's congratulations it like both guilds right now are like really insane uh and the difference is uh in most cases like very small in a rate tier and we're talking like half a day a couple hours whatever it is <clears throat> but uh if you come in second uh you're not the second place you're a loser and uh you'll be a loser for until the next year the first and, loser uh, we felt yeah. that for two tiers back to back as well and that feeling fucking sucks that's actually interesting. I like in your entire time playing WoW, was that like year or year and a half or whatever of us winning? Was that like one of the hardest times for you? Because you actually don't lose a lot, right? Like historically, like you've won basically every MDI, you've won most world first races. Yeah, it fuck it's fucking suck. And it wasn't easy either with the because there was the crossover and I lofa. I remember we actually Ben even joined us uh, after that point. And then the whole thing with Method happened on top of that. Uh, oh, yeah. And then the Echo remake and stuff like that. It was not the easiest uh, period, you can say the least. That was actually the one time in uh, in like my gaming career where I felt I got hate for something that was completely out of my control. And it hurt me a lot because of, you know, what type of thing it was that you were being accused of. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the worst part for me and for a lot of the players. It hurt a lot of the players and with internally within the guild. Do you think that affected you guys in Nathria? At that point, we had moved on a little bit from it. We didn't really see a lot of it from uh, like in the chats or anything like that. It was kind of like a closed chapter. And so I felt like we had moved on, um, but there was still some things we had to fix internally. First time scribe outside raid leading and stuff like that. So we still had to polish some of our prep a bit. Uh, which we did and we went extra hard in, in Sanctum uh, and then we kind of like just been optimizing more and more and going harder every single tier like trying even though we win we of course want to make sure that we optimize on the things that we felt like we could have done better last time uh, and I well, think that's, that's actually just been the that's dynamic. another good question I think I noticed that from Winnie Earl's <clears throat> Guild the first time we beat you all we noticed that you made a lot of sweeping changes. I think you guys were looking to maybe replace your tanks for a while, but you didn't do it until you lost. Um, and then it seemed like it was one of the first things you did, as well as some other roster stuff. Do you yeah, guys feel well, like also... when you won all of BFA, yeah. do you think it allowed you to be complacent until you were shown that you could lose? Yes, to a degree. You know, like uh, we felt like we could have, you know, Scribe wanted to play, of course. You know, taking the step outside is, uh, is a big step. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, if there you still sometimes you miss playing the game, miss being inside the raid, yeah. raiding progression, or if you're like, comp you're fine with being on the outside. But that was kind of like, uh, Scribe likes playing the game. He loves raiding and things like that, and he just took the sacrifice because it was best for the guild. Uh, Sko uh, was because of the position he had within the organization, but uh, it is uh, something that we've been wanting to change for a long time, mainly because it felt like Sko couldn't really keep up with the requirements of being like a hardcore raider. Uh, running the business and everything like that. He wasn't putting the same time as everyone else was because he realistically couldn't. And that was kind of affecting a little bit uh, in terms of the tanking performance. So it was definitely something we wanted to change for a long time, but we just didn't do it uh, because we didn't have to. So it was only after we lost that we got like a reality check and like said, okay, now it's time. We need to do it now. Yeah, I think being outside, I think during the race, it's good because it's not like oh, well, I don't get to have that much fun anymore because I feel like the time you spend playing the game, the amount of effort you spend doing that, you can just add that effort into whatever you're doing. Obviously, it's best for the team and that's the only thing that matters, but you can actually feel fulfilled because there's more you can do by being outside the raid. It's not like something's being taken away from you in a way. You can watch more POVs, you can handle more things, you can do more research in between pulls. You're less mentally exhausted from doing all of that while also playing every single pull. All that shit. Yeah, I mean, obviously everyone misses it who's doing this. In fact, I actually think a, <laughs> I actually think 21st Man's actually overrated. I think there's a lot of times, and I think our guild feels this more than yours, because I think Roger Brown is an extremely good and suitable raid leader, and he's in your role's raid at any given time. And we don't really have that 
And that is something to where I feel like me being in the raid would be really impactful, like for sure. Uh, obviously, the things that comes with that is obviously while you're turbo raid leading early pulls, your damage will be great, and then it'll be great later when it's like time to kill, which is like the only time it really matters. And there's like that slight optimization, but the amount of things you can change by actually being in the thick of it is a lot. I actually, I mean, I do that on my own. I, I purposefully don't kill these bosses for the first time with my guild after they're way more geared and are going to one-shot it. I, I progress with my own alt team that I do outside of like our normal guild raids to do that. And I think it's important that you go through that process and learn that all the things that go into that, not only to keep you more up to date for the next year, but also to challenge yourself and to make sure that you're doing everything you can to be the best. And I've seen while doing that, I can say this without a shadow of a doubt, that that team that I'm raid leading, if I was raid leading them from outside the raid instead of playing, we would be a significantly worse team, like significantly worse. And I think there's a little, now obviously the, the content isn't as hard as what we're doing in the race. And our guild obviously has far better players that are in this group, but that, you know, just that still does apply. And a lot of it isn't player skill. A lot of it is just being able to make quick swaps from being inside of it kind of thing. So dude, also just quick shout out your guild. If you're listening to this should never 21st man raid lead. It makes no sense outside of going for world first. It literally, unless like someone doesn't want to play the game at all. Wait, that's my guild. It doesn't make sense. There's no reason to make that sacrifice unless it's not a sacrifice for you, but I'm pretty sure Skype and I would both like in a perfect world would rather play. I think I think it's definitely obviously had a lot of influence. Uh, but likely as we talked about earlier, I don't know how much 21st Man mattered as much in Nihilotha. I, I doubt you'd see huge, huge differences uh, with it not being that way. Okay. I mean, you get to play uh, during farm anyway. Um, so like making that sacrifice leading up to progress, I guess is not too bad. Would you say you're washed as a player? Definitely not. I mean, I'm, okay. I mean, I'm playing right now with a bunch of uh, among other things, the people I recruited were all people who parse 99 or 100 on any of their logs I picked up before bringing them into Mythic. A couple of pro players from other games. And I fucking crank every single pull, probably last on deaths. Now, raiding in the guild, the last time I played, it was a long time ago. I was tanking because I had to. I think I was one of the better players in the guild. Uh, someone who joined your guild who recently is no longer there, Jeeth. This person and I do not get along whatsoever. It ended really rough in our guild. Him and I do not get along. But that guy will probably still tell you, and he said to my face and others that when I was playing, he thinks I was one of the best players in the guild. If I had to not raid lead and play, and all I had to do is focus on my own character, I think I would 100% play at a world first level. No question. I don't know if the amount that it takes out of you as a player to raid lead and play would be enough to make up for the difference of whoever the next best person on your roster is if you're just trying to focus on purely mechanical things but i think the ability of having a raid leader inside the raid would be different than that i mean uh, the outside raid leader is more than raid leading nowadays uh like you said it's problem solving it's like looking at the what went wrong looking at the vod from previous poll and then you know being able to come up with a solution quickly and uh, then progressing faster like most of the time we have scribe doing all of that shit like he's not even raid leading half the time we have like mirrors coming in and then doing the raid leading for him while he figures out strategies and whatnot comes well up that's with because the, uh, that's solutions. what raid leading is like you, you keep mentioning yeah. mirrors comes in and raid leading like like making the calls during a fight i feel like is often realized as the thing that is the most obvious to a viewer but it's not actually raid leading like 80 percent of raid leading is what you're saying scribe does when mirrors is raid leading it's or like calling things it's it's problem solving. Your job is to quickly, and what separates a good from bad raid leader is probably two things mainly, and that is the atmosphere and like accountability of your group. Of like, you know, if someone in your group messes up, Jinji, how many times last year do you think someone messed up and they purposefully didn't admit to it and you had to like search who did something wrong? It literally never happens, right? Like that cannot happen at this level. Um, it's a it's a problem we had in uh, previous years and uh, something that we have been discussing that that's sh it just cannot happen if you make a mistake you know we talk about it what happened you move on or whatever we see if we can fix it and also individual responsibility is that if there's a certain mechanic that is like uh, a little bit difficult or if you have another job assignment then you need to handle certain things then you need to come up with a solution to make it easier for you through a reminder weaker or whatever it is uh, to not have those mistakes happen because otherwise you're just wasting pulls and uh that's something that 
I think we've gotten better at yeah. over the course and of and you have to many, like many tiers. that has to come from the top too. Like I think I think your raid needs to know that you can't make mistakes often from that position, but if you do, you have to be willing to also say that I fucked up as well, just so other people feel comfortable in saying that for themselves. And that's like just an accountability and raid atmosphere thing. And I think the in, basically the other half of it, like 45% is just your ability to see a problem on a boss that hasn't been progressed before and solve that problem as efficiently as you can and move on from that. That's most of raid leading. It's not calling things. And the reason that you don't see a lot of people very good at that, and actually I think one of the biggest reasons why there's really been only two guilds that have realistically had a chance of winning any race in the past four years is how do you get good at that? If your method, if your pieces, if your BDG, how do you actually get good at problem solving an end boss when every single time you get there, we've already figured it out? You know what I mean? Like, it, like I think it's like impossible to overcome that. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you just settle for third. Um, I mean, I think that's the position where pieces and method is, uh, or pieces were and method uh, is in right now, uh, is that they need to do something different if they want to try and take the step up to be a world's first contender. They cannot be where they are now. Um, 100%. And it is a good point you said, like, raid atmosphere. I think it's important to be able to discuss things and be open about, have a, you know, a good conversation with your teammates. Not be afraid to ask questions, not be afraid to come with uh, suggestions, and also not be afraid to say you fucked up. Uh, I think it only ever happens if someone makes a mistake and they're not 100% sure if it was them or not, then you, in some cases you have to look into it because something could have happened that they might not even have noticed, you know. But uh, people are usually good at speaking up when, when they fuck up. That was something, uh, really that was like one of the anymore. first things we did in our guild was make it so you always instantly make you like say something when you mess up and like we almost overdid it like basically what i wanted is like if a new player came into our guild which like people can come from different atmospheres it's very normal in some guilds actually there's a there's a like a u.s guild that we've actually got a lot of our players from and their raid leader would literally just fucking berate people for making mistakes so i noticed when we would recruit often good players from these teams they would have the tendency of being defensive when you ask them things because that's what they were taught that's what happened to them for years and if I'm asking you something, it's not personal and I'm not berating you, but I need to know the answer and I'm going to be direct and we have to figure out the answer and move on to be efficient. And that can only come if you are instantly willing to acknowledge your mistake and learn from it kind of thing. And we've had to teach a lot of our players that, so basically we overdo it. If you, if you miss a soak and you're right next to it as a new player, what I would want when that goes off is I want some other player who is even five yards further from you to be like, oh, that was my fault. I could have soaked that. And then that new player looks at that other player and they're like, oh, holy fuck, that guy, like he, uh, that guy and I both know that I should have soaked that, but that guy like took the fall for it because he doesn't give a fuck and he just wants to move on and says he could have did it kind of thing. And I think that kind of stuff really has to exist at this level 100%. To, to like yeah. coexist, yeah. I think that's uh, the difference between like, uh, like a, a really good player. Being self-critical, looking at potential solutions that you could have done rather than what someone else, look at like what, always look at what you could have done better what you could have improved on and i think if you have that mindset you're onto something good and you're gonna improve as a player it's hard um, to get that way though like you said even with your guild it took you a long time there were tears where you even won where you felt like that wasn't great you have to it's like something you constantly have to work on to make people especially as you get a bunch of new players is you have to just make sure that they know that that is the expectation it's really hard really hard like the people the amount of people in chat like, how many of you guys raid in a guild where you feel like it's full accountability? You never have to look at something. Like, with 20 people, that is an insane amount of people. It's impossible to procure that. There's actually probably, I don't know, there's probably less than five, I'm just making this up, like five guilds probably that exist that have, like, a true atmosphere like that. It's a requirement of being good. Would you say that the, the mindset of the players in your guild has changed? Like, um, now you have a lot of uh, European recruits, right? How many players do you have from uh, Europe uh, nowadays? Ooh. Do you think that their mindset is like different mm. from the Americans or very similar? Um, what is your like a uh, first impression? So what I've noticed from European players, which I actually really mm. enjoy because this is how I am, is they're very direct. And I like direct. I don't like beating around the bush. I think especially many in North... people call them toxic. I, I think... They're I, passionate. I, 
Well, no, I would say none of the people in our guild that we've recruited from EU are even close to toxic. It's just well, yeah, yeah, it it's, it's just, just that they're it's honest toxic. and they just fucking get to the point. And I think a lot of people, oh. especially North American players, when they listen to European teams, they misunderstand that. Because in American yeah. culture, it's normal to try to be more nice, I guess. And you beat around the bush instead of getting to things. Yeah, you that like cool, when you hear it, aggressive. yeah, exactly. When you hear it from a European team, you think you're like, oh, they just like they're like mad at each other. But really, it's just a culture difference. And they're, in fact, I'd rather be in a guild that it was even slightly toxic, if we're being honest. If it meant that they actually got to the point and solved problems faster than, you know, beating around the bush and being nice about it, and like a lot of American teams are. I have noticed that a, not too much in our guild because our guild was kind of like that before they came here. We have 12 European Raiders now and probably growing. I mean, there's, I, yeah. that, it's like 12, including analysts, maybe it's 10, but like, I, I think that number is only going to get bigger. If you look at the EU group finder and mythic plus, if you look at the amount of competitive, like trying to be good at the game, wow guilds that exist in EU compared to NA, it's probably times five. We literally like the Five times as many good guilds. There, there is zero, almost no talent being developed it's in very NA. True in M plus two. There's almost no talent being developed in NA. So if we're continuing to get better in recruiting the best players, they're almost always going to come from EU at this point. Like NA rating outside of us is just know. dead. I don't even know Impact and Ribbons were EU. We've also had to move our raid times. It's very interesting. We raid. I think we're like the earliest raiding NA guild men. We raid it like uh, we we start our raid two hours ago during the week because we don't want our European players to be up at like five in the morning because we, we dealt with that for a while especially with Wolf um because like Wolf raided here for a while Wolf did not leave on bad terms I think he got sat for a whole raid and that kind of sucked and maybe that had some reason why he left but like he still is cool with the guild uh it's just he was going to university and doing EU MDI times while raiding an NA farm raid schedule I you guys can kind of wrap your head around that time requirement that's like fucking crazy like you're just expected to be awake like 20 hours a day it doesn't it doesn't add up um oh rating at all with mdi is ridiculous like i don't that's insane if he was even doing that because pretty much me and dorky and everyone else when we were doing full schedule we were just like fuck no we're not rating we raid one you know one clear a week i couldn't even imagine having to show up to multiple raids a week while doing mdi yeah, so you kind of get the point. But uh, as far as, like, atmosphere, I don't think the atmosphere is different at all. I actually think most of our Europeans are, like, very... Our, our guild is often not seen as direct because we laugh and joke around a lot. But th that can only happen because if anything ever real comes up, we immediately get to it and it's not personal. And that's the only reason we can kind of act like that. And I think a lot of the European players have, like, fit into that pretty well. Also, doing, like, uh, when you guys progress... I noticed that you guys, uh, this is something that we used to do in the past a lot. Uh, back in like uh, old school days, off stream, Serenity. We were memeing so much and also in early method days, doing polls and doing uh, progression and whatnot. And it usually went fine. Nowadays, we just cannot do it. As soon as you start memeing, someone dies, someone fucks up, someone forgets their rally. I don't know. It just always some random shit happens. So now we're like super strict. Oh, we're just listening to raid leading and we're just focused. Uh, yeah. But you guys still meme, uh, meme uh, around a lot. Do you feel like that has like an impact on your uh, performance at all? Because we just had um, like, we just stopped doing it completely. Um, yes and no. I think there are times where it happens too much and people lose focus and you lose like a, I don't know, like a pull or something a day to something like that where you're like, all right, we're going a little too hard. But I actually think it helps mm. people relax and stay focused as well. Because I think something that a lot of the viewers won't know that you definitely know is like you're up for like 15, 16 hours a day playing. And you do not have 15 to 16 hours of like really good play. Like it's like it's extremely mentally exhausting, right? You probably have like somewhere, especially after a few days, like 9 to 10 to 11 hours, which is why taking breaks and things like that are good. But like staying mentally relaxed and things like that is very important. And it's just very simple. Number one, we don't try to do that. That's not forced. That's just, we just happen to find a bunch of like really fucking funny people that randomly are good at WoW and are in our guild and they just say funny ass shit all the time. That's part of it. But the other part is I think people actually focus more. If we raided like you all raid where it's 100% serious and like that kind of stuff isn't allowed because you feel like it's inefficient, we would 100% play worse. Like I'm positive. In fact, we've tried. Like we're like, you know, maybe we should try or care more, but that never really changed anything and it never 
it just really wasn't us. It was fake. It was it was like we were trying to be someone we weren't. And that didn't really have a positive effect. I would say when we were playing our best is when there is light memeing going on, we're laughing in between pulls and we're having like efficient, good progression. When we're fully serious, we are usually tilting and playing bad. And when we meme too much, it's bad. It's about finding a right balance. But I really think more than anything, it's just the guilds. And maybe this is me because I'm, I'm like kind of an idiot. But like we just are who we are. We just have like a distinct guild personality. And I think we just try to stick to that. You know, I've noticed, I noticed in some other guilds when we won, I noticed other guilds that were normally, not you guys, but I noticed other guilds that were like behind us try to be more fun as if it was like a reason that we were winning. Like we were just laughing more, I guess. And it seemed so put on and like they were like trying to be light in raid intentionally, even though it wasn't natural. And that is kind of like what it would be like for us to not be like that. It would be like forcing That's our... Four stars. That's cringe. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it's turbo cringe. Yeah, it's turbo cringe. But like, it, it would be, it would be like forcing us to be someone we're not. We we did it more after Sepulcher. I think after Sepulcher, we're like, damn, losing, turbo sucks. So, let's do everything we can going into next raid to make sure that like we do everything possible to win. We're not looking at Twitch chat. We're not looking at this. We're just, just so many things changed. Took testing more seriously, all those things, and we even talked about like, dude, let's just fucking be fully serious. But it just can't happen. It's just not who we are. Um. I don't, and I don't, I don't think it's a huge negative. I'd say we lose on average one pull a day to letting it go too far, like on average, which I don't think is that bad. And I think it allows players to enjoy it more. And also, um, this is something that uh, people discuss every time. If, uh, especially, and it could also be annoying for you guys, like every time you win, uh, the head start is always being put into question, right? How much realistically do you think uh, you guys starting first is an advantage? Or if you even think it's an advantage? All right, so first of all, this tilts the fuck out of me. And also, this is something that oh, here we go, here we go. I feel ready, like <laughs> this is something that I feel like for some of you guys, for sure. I think there's no way your fans can be this like brain dead about the head start without you guys at least playing into it a little bit. It has to be there because I understand you guys are mad about it. But He's like already called Twitch chat brain dead. Bro, I, I, the amount of brain dead people that I interact with, man, they're not all brain dead, but there's a lot of them. Like, let's just look at the two times we won, right? We won a Nihilotha by like two days. Like anyone calling head start for that, I just, I don't even know what to, what to say, right? Um, uh, that one was uh, definitely, we got outplayed. There's um, no question. And in Castle Nathria, we started our, our release times at that point were 16 hours ahead of you guys. We had... 10 hours of maintenance before we killed Denathrius. So at even the best argument would be that we had six hours to play ahead of you guys by the time the race was over. And we won by more than 16 hours. So I, I don't see the argument. Uh, that was actually, that tier specifically, I think uh, was because the internally within the guild, the race was lost kind of. And I think it affected our performance towards the end of the progress. Yeah, the same uh, thing happened to if, us this raid, killing Razageth yeah. as well, by the way. If there was one tier where, let's say, we didn't care about you guys getting the kill first. We it didn't strike us at all mentally. I think Castanafria was the one tier where we would actually have a chance of winning on time looking at the reset times, right? I think if there was one mm. tier where we could have done it, it okay. was that tier. Now, while I'll accept that, I'll also throw mm -hmm. one more rebuttal. One of the biggest advantages that exists for the NA guilds with the increased reset time is actually the end of week one in a two-week race where you guys will continue to progress. And obviously, at that point in the raid, we're at the point where if there was never a reset every single day, we would wake up past you. We would go to sleep. You pass us. That kind of stuff. But on Tuesday, we get to re-clear while you guys progress. So we're getting gear and we're getting info. These are typically like high efficiency times for us because we don't really usually have an opportunity to look at what you guys are doing. Yeah, that's the worst uh, day for us like yeah, mentally. Exactly. Like, we know that that's happening. Exactly. Yeah. But in Castle Nathria, you guys turned your streams off for like a day and a half. And, you know, we did the entire last boss without any information, basically, until the basically we had our whole strat with nothing of what you guys were doing. Um, so I would say that in a scenario where you guys are streaming and we did start at the same time, I think that would have also trended in our favor slightly as well, but I think it would have been close. 
but I don't know if it would be enough to see. That's where I get off on that. So you're saying as a competitor, and I can respect that with that, with no advantage. I think in Castle Nathry we would have had a chance to win because you're saying that even though you killed it ten hours after we had a head start after you, you're saying that you killed it ten hours later because you were tilted. I I, I just I, I can accept that from you. I can't accept that from one of your fans being like, no, you didn't actually win because you started before this team and that math doesn't even add up. Like even this raid, the amount of times I saw people this raid saying, dude, Lamau, you fucking last, you lost with a, with a 16 hour advantage. First of all, two things about that. It's not even 16 hours anymore. It's fucking 12 hours. And also we got fucking eight hours of maintenance again that uh, other regions are not seeing. So at the very best, this raid, we start four hours ahead of them. And even regardless of all of that, here's what gets me is even in a scenario where we start 16 hours ahead of you, no maintenance, just fucking straight up ahead of you, our, our raids are offset, no matter what, including you guys starting ahead, four days into the race, we're just waking up and passing the other team anyway. So what real advantage is there? The only advantage is killing some early stuff first, you get better stream viewership on the first day, and if it's killed right around a reset, you get massive time advantages and potentially can kill the boss before the other team even sees it. But those things it haven't. Be... But those things haven't yeah. happened. None of them have happened nope. ever. So like the uh, discrediting of our wins and the constant mm. conversation about how we're somehow like fucking cheating and getting ahead of you guys from your fans is fucking ridiculous. And it's definitely one of the things that makes me hate the fuck out of doing this for sure. I like how how you hold the fans in the Twitch chat are so accountable <laughs> to this issue. That's the biggest. That's the funniest thing. Is just like if I you mean, dealt with them as much dude, as I, I did, you do the same thing. I love the as much no. as the next guy, but dude, sometimes I don't know. Man, Especially with something like the shatters. dude, you're so much bigger, and then the race world purse is even so much bigger than that. Like, dude, I couldn't. even... I mean, first of all, you called the chat brain dead like a second ago. <laughs> as based. I mean, I, I understand why it's so fucking stressful and so tilting. I would probably be tilted out of my mind, too. But... All I'll say is I promise that I want a global release more than anyone else because I'd never have to deal with this shit ever again. I think it actually mm. amplifies the amount of hate we get, and I don't think it's changed the result of any race that's happened so far at all. And it, I, the only thing is I mean, all the EU hasn't... people, they say they want global release, yeah. and then they'll actually be on NA's maintenance schedule, and they'll have twice mm. as much fucking maintenance to deal with all the time. They'll be like, oh, actually, this sucks. I would actually say that it's been close to, to like, I think that's the reason it's been close. On Sylvanas, imagine a, um, a world where we didn't kill it on the last day of reset. And you just go in, re-clear, you one-shot the boss, right? That would have been... It didn't happen. World That ending. would have been fucking shit. Yeah, that would have that been, would have that would have been literal fucking... That would have been the same thing as this time. Like, you, we would have killed the boss, and then people would have tried to decide the world first for how long after the reset it took to re-clear and kill it. Just like how we woke up today... Like, literally fresh off of waking up on Razageth, obviously tilted as fuck. Like, I don't want to hear it from any Echo competitor or fan. Dude, if you guys were in that position where they nerf that boss later that night after you go to sleep, or nerf that boss the previous night and we kill it before you wake up, you would have been just as fucking tilted. And we had to play through that and kill that boss. No one wanted to be there. Uh, mm. And that, that, that feeling is fucking horrible. And that's just, I don't know, that, that's the kind of shit I'm talking about, man. How do you feel uh, Blizzard should have handled this situation? Should they just have not nerfed the boss at all? They should yeah. just they, make it easier. He, he, here's, here's, what, here's what they should do. You ready? <laughs> Don't overtune them. Fucking tune the raid correctly. And it's oh, not shit. and, and it's not it's not like they haven't done this before. They did this for fucking years. Where you go in, we have way more gear than everyone else, just like now. And we progress through the entire raid with like, what do you think in a normal raid, like before Sepulchre, like maybe one or two, like, I remember we killed Orgazoa. Remember you guys were going to bed and they nerfed Orgazoa and we killed it? How much time efficiency do you think that lost you guys? Like, like two hours, three hours, like, like literally like the fucking tiniest shit of all time, like in previous raids mm. on average, right? And then, yeah. and then this raid is just like every single boss is just like, no matter what guild is there, you just get stuck at a fucking roadblock. It affected both guilds multiple times and it's really anti it's more than anything it's just not fun the thing i was talking about with razageth was like that boss was took two weeks because of all the time we were sitting there waiting for nerfs and it also caused them to ruin the boss have you guys actually looked at what kind of a boss razageth is compared to other end bosses the first phase is hard the first intermission is hard they've now nerfed those multiple times p2 is easy p2 intermission is easier and the p3 intermission if you were able to just pull it on pull like fallen avatar style you could one shot it like that's how easy the last phase of an end boss is 
because they just had to give up and over nerf it because they were running out of time before Christmas, right? I don't know. I, I, it's just the last two raids, what I think they need to do better is whatever the fuck they changed in the last year, revert all of it. They, they, they tuned raids way better than the last two for years, and now it's bad, and I don't know why it's bad. It, I think at the, at the end of the day, I don't think any raid tier so far where we've been competing against each other that the best team has not won uh, in either case. And whatever outcome, global release, head start, I think the outcome would have been the same in terms of the performance that was shown um, while we were playing. I don't think there's been a tier where we won, uh, where you guys deserved it or vice versa. But that being said, I do think that in any competition, you want to be on the same level. Um, just so there is absolutely zero question about it, because whether it's a small factor or a big factor, just just, just not be any difference in a competition should be on the same level. And uh, I think that's why I would love to see it. And um, having global release, maybe potentially playing with NA players, that would also maybe solve some of the problems that is in M+, uh, with raids, being able to play with, uh, you know, each other, I think might solve some problems on the NA side. Pretty sure that the, the technology exists. Yeah, it, it is 2023 after all. I will say though, this is definitely bringing up some Dude, me staying silent for that month and just ignoring all of this because saying anything or staying silent, no matter what I do, I get shit on. I have no idea what any of my guildmates said. I heard that I heard the CEO of our of Liquid said some shit on Twitter. Uh, never read it. I have no idea. Hey, um, you got heat from that too as well. The thing is, like, the but me like, sitting the, there, the eyes are on you guys immediately. They're just waiting for you to make like one snappy comment, one wrong thing, and they're like, they're ready. They're not ready on, on me, by the way. I don't know. It's only the Americans they're targeting. So you guys have a little bit more ruffle over there. I think the European fans, like you said, they have no uh, no chill. <laughs> they go at you hard. Yeah, and the thing that got me the most, though, was people just making shit up for that month. Like, like you came in today and you asked me, can you explain the, like, oversleeping thing or, like, starting your raid late? That just goes to show you that, like, the general consensus of that, based on, I don't even know who the fuck said all this shit, was that we, like, started our raid late and, like, overslept. And yeah, that's I mean, just made up. Is... It's literally made up. We literally woke up early. And the only this reason... I... Oh, dude. I was like, okay, you guys got early information. Uh, you have the opportunity to wake everyone up, but for some reason, you're too lazy to do it. That's what most people think, by the way. Uh, and I'm very surprised that you weren't there to play when the nerf came in. Uh, which is, of course, you've explained that's not the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I, I can never clarify it because if I speak up at all, I'm salty. We lost. Right. So, so here, even in chat, 10 a.m. is not early. Bro, like, I feel like you guys are totally missing the point. Like, what, what are you, you're, you're like trying to bend so many things to say that, like, we should have, like, only been awake for eight hours the previous day to be ready for a nerf in the morning that you never know is going to happen and they also were not frequently nerfing things in the morning either <laughs> you're just treating your raid like a normal raid day and our raid time was there for a reason but what do you think about the communication i'm not in that discord um that you guys are in you know um but has do you feel like the communication between the top guilds and blizzard regarding nerfs and what they want to do has it been better uh do you think they're they're doing a good job do you think what do you think they should improve on um in the future with anything really uh communication between the guilds nerf well, timings like how do they handle that this is what i said earlier i don't know I don't know when they they needed to nerf that boss. There was no time for them to nerf that boss that does not fuck someone over. Literally mm -hmm. impossible. There was no time to nerf it where... Like, I guess people in hindsight are like, oh, well, they should have done it later in the day or they should have given way more notice so both guilds could get prepared and wake up and are ready to do it. But, like, I don't know. Blizzard's not paying attention to that shit. They just slam it. Uh, I don't know. I left that Discord as soon as that happened. I have no idea. Okay. And was other cases like that during progress that was not Rasekaf related that you feel like was also like completely crazy? The the communication has been fine. It's been better than it has in the past. I would say it was a little weird in Sepulchre because that was the first raid. But yeah, I don't know. It was a little bit better in that raid. Like, I don't know. We were like pulling Dathia and we were like, hey, so this is bullshit. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, well, we'll look into it. 
they they make sure not to give you any like heads up in the past they were like giving some heads up on stuff and now all the, all the information on when anything is going to get nerfed is like universal across both teams like i said i left the discord i don't want to I, I i think we're better off just not hearing anything from blizzard and just playing the game also dude i can't okay. i can't there's stuff in chat people are saying echo we're starting around seven by the way i what have i not what have i not explained echo didn't have maintenance they started at realm up we had four hour maintenance our time to start playing was four hours later that's why our times are different i'm i'm literally gonna die if i keep seeing i, I did no one should have to read that you have any more questions i think all the other people got tired of us they fucking ran out of here no no, no i'm not tired of this i'm having a great time oh yeah i hope it's not too boring <laughs> No, I mean, uh, I from from talk. what I heard, like, uh, yeah, chat, are you enjoying this conversation? I mean, I'm enjoying it. I get a lot of more insight as well into uh, Liquid, you know, because there's a lot of things I don't know. So uh, it's uh, kind of fun to get to know the competitors a little bit more. If they have similar mindsets, different things like that. But I think we kind of live in the same boat, I guess, uh, in a lot of areas. But I think you have been one of the people that have gotten quite a lot of heat. And I think that's because you are who you are. Speak your mind. And... Uh, just always remember that some people will like it and some people won't. You just uh, don't give a fuck, bro. I wonder if you ever deal with this. I think it's like a weird thing because like, I feel like as a streamer, it's easy for a lot of streamers to look at people in their chat as a number, right? Uh, where- They're just bots. They're, or they're just bots, yeah. I don't know, if you look at it at a more human level than that, each one of those people are people. Right? It's kind of hard to imagine. Like right now, like I don't, I haven't even checked how many viewers I have. Like I'm just imagining like an auditorium with this many people sitting down and spending their time oh, listening yeah, I to cannot you. imagine talking to that many people. I've, I've right? Isn't it crazy? Okay, but the yeah, second, the NPCs second there. you humanize them, which is natural because they are all humans. They're spending their time watching you and subbing to you and stuff. As soon as you humanize them, what they say matters to you. And I don't think I'm alone in being someone who really, really focuses on the negative stuff instead of the positive i could read a thousand positive comments but as soon as someone fucking says we overslept the race and has no fucking clue what they're talking about that's the only thing i'm going to think about all day because i just cannot stand people being confidently wrong yeah that gets to me a lot i think it gets to a lot of people but i don't know i i feel like is if you view your chat as people and not numbers it's really easy to have the haters say some shit that fucks you up but the only way to really shield yourself from that is to look at all of them as a number but uh, in cases like this because this also happens in my chat what i like to do is to educate them and i educate them in a funny way so they know that they're stupid as fuck and everyone laughs about it and it's great content <laughs> i think that's a really good way to deal with it yeah there's also just anytime you have thousands of viewers if you just statistically look at it there's just going to be the more popularity you get the more haters you get as well and then also like you said being Speaking your mind I will always rub people the wrong way. So you will always uh, have people that don't like you for that. I just am always conflicted about the race just because, like, if I'm being completely honest, like, two years ago when races were coming up, even when we were currently not the, the winners of the previous race, I was just excited to compete and excited to go up against you guys because it's always super close and it's really fun. And just the whole process of, forget any other team, just... Literally the process of going through PTR and problem solving and finding the perfect comp and recruiting and trying new players and all of those things. That's always like really fascinating. And I really look forward to that. I genuinely do not look forward to new races that come out now. They're super fun, but all the baggage that comes with it, the fucking cringe stuff that people say, the incorrect takes about how the last raid ended, the, you know... It's like basically like Twitch chat has to decide whether you win or lose if you are allowed to be happy for a few months or something. Even though I'd never stop doing it. Like, let me be clear. Like, I mean, I, I I like my teammates too much and I am not quitting. I just, it's just, uh, just really not fun. Do you think that's been because I'm a, I'm a fucking shitty loser as well. Like, uh, do you think it's because of uh, you losing or have you also felt that way after winning? Because I remember like mm, yeah. one uh, clip that you posted on social media. Uh, it was a video. It was very emotional. I have, I have a dog myself. I know you have dogs too. It was like a very emotional clip when you came home after winning and you saw them uh, after a long time and they just greeted you, jumped on you and you were just so genuinely happy. Uh, and I mean, that is like, there's no greater feeling than that. Um, but on the opposite, like on the downside, if you then lose, bro, I'm fucking miserable when I lose. I hate it. Um, but, you ha but you have to hate it. 
Like, I, I feel like yeah. if anyone doesn't absolutely despise losing, like, literal depression you just your passion. coming from losing, then you probably, I mean, it sounds stupid, but you probably don't care enough about what you're doing. Like, that's what I tell myself. Like, like if I'm not absolutely wrecked by losing, I don't know if I put my all into making sure that we won. I think that's, like, kind of natural if you put everything into it. To answer your question, I don't know, because there's two major factors. Well, I mean, number one, it definitely matters, right? Because if we win, I don't get nearly as much or any hate so that's good um like that so so losing matters in that way as well it's not even just the pain of losing it's just what you have to read for six months i guess but the thing that i can't tell is where i've really started to feel like that is the last two raids which we did happen to lose but i didn't feel this way after sanctum dude when i lose i want someone to beat the fuck out of me because then at the oh. end of that you can almost leave and be like, we tried our best, but goddamn, that team was just way too good. And it's easy to accept that, I think. And you go back to the drawing board and you move on. Like, I can just tell you, like, losing Sanctum, we had a fucking DC on a pull 1% below our best P3 push. And we DC'd, we had a healer DC in the last phase, and we, we ended up not killing it. Like, we were potentially a DC away of killing it that night and then having to deal with the crazy shit the next day <laughs> of of them killing it within 16 hours of us and that whole crazy shit. But even then, we lost, and I was like, dude, they fucking outplayed the fuck out of us on Kel'Thuzad, they played better on Painsmith, we caught up on Sylvanas, but it didn't matter because they just played better than us. And that was it, I didn't, I didn't feel bad at all. After losing Sepulchre, it was like, dude, we were playing so well, and it just went on this long, and just at some point along that super long period of time, we just lost it, you know? And that's a shitty way to lose, because you feel like you beat yourself. And then this raid, the fucking nerf thing, like that, I'll, I will probably never look at that positively. I try not to ever think about it, and I never talk about it. But like, that feels like shit, right? So the way we lost the last two raids, specifically, losing in general, and then also the combination of the fact that the last two raids, winning or losing, have been infinitely less fun to progress than previous raids because of the running into a brick wall, it getting nerfed, and then continuing thing, which has never happened before, but is now a thing. That that part has made me... I mean, that I mean, you probably feel that as well. I mean, it, it's infinitely less fun to progress bosses like that. So, like, that has just taken a lot of the fun out of it in general. But uh, Killing a boss after it's been killed already is, like... No, it's not enjoyable. I mean, at that point, you're already... The tears already gone done in your head at that point right you play to win and if you don't win it's like over well it's not uh, even well, i'm not oh. even talking about the winning thing as much i'm talking about like specifically the like you're ready to progress the p1 intermission mm. but you can't because all you can do is go to one side wait with 20 people and then wait for an yeah, nerf like and then that. and then you get to the storm yeah. surge and you keep trying it and you break it and then it's like okay this has to get nerfed and then you get to the last phase that didn't need to get nerfed but it, it did because of the time but yeah, I'm actually surprised that they fucked up so badly in Resca regarding this. I think the last time I, uh, I, I progressed a boss that was this badly tuned or overtuned uh, was uh, Kill Jaden um, back in, uh, in Tumor Zagaris. I think that was just as much off the mark as Resca was, where you literally just can progress a certain part of the fight and then you're just stuck and you're just sitting there waiting for nerfs. Back then it was off stream, so people didn't really have as much eyes on it. But that's literally several expansions like before this. I would have assumed that Blizzard are now getting a good grasp of uh, tuning. And it seems that a lot of cases they do it perfectly. And then you see something like Sanctum. I think they did Painsmith perfectly. I think they did yeah, even Painsmith's perfect. Uh, yeah, Soul Render, like Sludge an early Fist. boss, was also like on point. Uh, like, and then they fuck up with. Uh, I think they fucked up with uh, Fate Scribe. I think it was too easy. Same um, with Guardian too. And, I feel like Guardian, yeah, Guardian was, a, was complete troll. It was a huge letdown. They Guardian, first of all, has to follow Sludge Fist, which is maybe one of the best, like, those kind of bosses of all time. But it had so much complexity in testing. You could, like, charge different batteries at different points. Before they buffed the damage of the thing, you could, like, overheal or underheal and, like, maybe kill it faster. Like, there was, like, a lot of different strats involved. And they made it the most basic boss ever and able to be killed in, like, one pull. And then, obviously, Kelth is on. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, what yeah, a but fucking he nightmare! The fuck out of him, but yeah, that was a weird boss, bro. That's one of the bosses where I think like uh, we had a very big tactical advantage if, uh, if streaming wasn't actually there. You guys didn't know about the what's it called, or at least didn't play around the tank trinkets, right? Uh, suiciding people. Okay, so we actually did know about that, but not before the raid. Okay. We before you guys hmm. got to Kelthazad, you guys killed Kelthazad before we woke up. 
or as we were waking up, we f turned our streams off early and we farmed normal tank trinkets for that boss before you guys got to it. But you guys used it before we used it. But we didn't do it before. We didn't like do it during Heroic Week. We like found out, we were like, oh, Tank Trink would be insane for this. This works. We found out it, we we literally did it live and found out it worked. And we we're like, oh, we can probably cheat death this. So we got the other tank in uh, DH's uh, trinket. The okay. big thing for you guys there was was uh, just getting the timing right on on repeating the phase and making it all the same. I really wonder what that, what that fight designer thought. <laughs> watching his like creation just get absolutely fucking scienced out like that <laughs> yeah oh yeah we found this out on ptr and uh yeah it just uh, stayed i'm very surprised we we didn't really expect it to go live like this uh a lot of these things but uh yeah i mean we noticed very fast uh in ptr and then we actually just stopped doing it on ptr testing okay. in hopes of that they wouldn't figure it out so 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 we did the same thing we actually, on PTR, we did the super long wait, keep the cooldowns up strat. Like literally, your, your all strat was a more advanced version of it, but we were like, oh, this is how it works. And then we got hard baited. We had uh, our bigwigs guy who was his first tier with us. He like posted in the Keltazad channel. He's like, oh, they changed the actual sequencing. It no longer does this. It will always like continue its cast sequence based on when you phase it. It doesn't repeat anymore. And we're like, oh, fuck, that whole strat doesn't work. But we never tested it. Cause we, like this was at the uh, this was like when we were doing mythic, and then we just went into the boss and just did the other thing and didn't test it. It was really fucking stupid. Cause we literally I had an interview with one of your analysts. Like there was some like preach interview race world first thing and like there was like multiple guilds there, and I literally it, like alluded to that you could break the boss this way if they don't fix it, and whoever was your analyst at the time told me they were like, yeah, I was like, we thought you all like knew how it worked. And I was like, yeah, we, we did. And then we just fucking didn't do it. Dude, but the, another one this raid was this. How do you get Dathia that wrong? I know you guys weren't doing Dathia at the time, but we had all platforms dead and lasted like a minute and a half after it was dead. Mm. And we wiped it like 20%. And then they just were like, oh, wait, fuck. We just forgot an entire elemental and also like nerf the boss's health or something like that. Like it... Instead of, they, they removed all the challenge from the fight. Because it would have been really challenging. But then they nerfed the health and added the thing. I just don't like, where do you get the numbers that you can kill that boss in four elementals week one? You know? Or at least as a mid-tier boss. I just don't understand. That never used to happen. Like, how do you get Painsmith perfect, but then do Dathia like that? Another thing as well, and this is what I... I love this, by the way. About the Sepulchre. And uh, I was very surprised that they actually made it work. Um, I mean, you, you could argue that it wasn't perfect, but I think Raglan tuning and... Raglan was amazing. I mean, Dreadlots, yeah, and Dreadlots, of course, I mean, it's probably not intended that they wanted you to kill the boss past in Rage, but the, the top guilds figured out ways to deal with that. Not being able to raid test the bosses on PTR before they come out, I would love to see more of that personally. Oh, yeah. Um... I think, I think it was everyone so much would. better for the game. Dude, could you imagine a world where there's global release and we zone in with no dungeon journal and the dungeon journals get released as the bosses die? And like, you're literally, you're just progressing it natty. Like there's no information. There's no PTR information. You are see, you are learning the boss's name when you zone in. That would be fucking sick. That would be like so cool. But there's, I would love it. Yeah, there's probably love it. there's probably no world where that happens, and if not for one reason, and that's because you know what, like ninety nine point nine nine percent of the game, it would be no different for them, and it would only be for us. In general, they don't make any decisions when that's the logic. You think so? You don't think uh, people enjoy seeing content for the first time um, in the game? I think people would love that. People would love to watch it, but I feel like people would complain that they were less prepared for their raids because of that. Even though by the time they actually raided, there would be multiple dungeon journals out and they would, uh, they'd be able to see that. They'd be able to have it already by the time they raid. Even if it was just mythic mechanics being new. Even something like that as like a stepping stone. Like, basically there's no mythic dungeon journal. You just get to a mythic boss and it does something totally different and you are seeing that for the first time would be huge. I feel like nowadays, like even the early bosses, people have to uh, do like tons of heroic clears. And like heroic Razagev tuning was completely ridiculous this time around. That was probably one of the hardest heroic bosses I think uh, that we've ever had to uh, to kill. Um, I don't remember. 
a boss that was that hot. Anduin. Anduin before they nerfed it uh, in Sepulchre. The one that only you and us killed, and then they nerfed it right after. Yeah, I feel like that was harder. Bad. That boss was fucking insane. The the, the mm. shields on Heroic were like, <laughs> were like 3 million or something in Sepulchre. I get the global release argument for them, but you're you're right that I feel like they would have to unite the two realms. They would unite the two regions before they could do global release, because then that breaks their entire logic of why it would be bad. Yeah. All right, Dorky, you got anything, bud? Oh, I was just talking about how like I never liked it when I had to back in more casual guilds, where I'd have to like do homework before a raid. You know how they'd always be like, "Oh, all right, everyone, make sure you look up." A boss fight video on this specific boss before you come to raid that's a good point actually like everyone would be in the raid figuring things out for the yeah. first time so everything leading up to that you wouldn't have to do well, anything you'd still like you watch streams you'd watch streams of it but yeah the uh but i'm, I'm talking like you know like straight up heroic guilds or even yeah before that you're right because they have like you know like uh what are those youtube guides called the uh, fat boss guides or whatever that people yep, watch yep. before it comes out, you would be like figuring it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually surprised. Well, not too surprised that there aren't more people who do blind progression in WoW. Like in Final Fantasy, for example, that game has pretty challenging raid content. And there's actually a decent bit of the community that intentionally doesn't look up anything. And like, well, it's not too many, but like an okay amount of people that like try to figure it out on their own. Like certainly more than a couple groups. Like literally in WoW, the only people who are doing a boss like blind are the first team to kill it. Right? That's it. And then after that, every other team is in their best interest to look at it. And in lower guilds, you could progress the whole raid while figuring it all out yourself and using your own strats and stuff. But then you'd just be like wasting 20 people's time, you know? You'd oh, be like you'd be like progressing for like an extra month or some shit. You'd have a lot more it's enjoyment just a much of more it. more enjoyable experience when you're like actually doing the fights Oh yeah. What's the word? I, I, I don't want to say like authentically, but you know, it's a different experience for sure. I actually think that's one of the worst parts of the gl of no global release is actually for Echo. Like I remember actually this in a interview with Roger Brown after Nihilotha, and he was like, "That was the least fun I've ever had in any raid," and the reason why is they didn't get to figure out any bosses. By the time they got to a boss, we either had it almost dead or dead, and they didn't get to actually go through the like fun problem solving raid thing. They were just always copying, which is what every other guild does besides both of our guilds. And the only reason we can do that on every fight is because we start ahead. So like, yeah, that fucking sucked. Like we were, that was the first time we had that dynamic where we just got to a boss and you guys were already like close to killing it. And we just like at that point had a full strat already in front of us and we just copied it and we were forever behind. It sucked so hard. And to think that's oh. actually what every other guild does every single raid. Yep. No matter what. That is and you're talking about the difference between how much that sucks versus normal, and that's literally the normal experience for everyone else. Yeah, I I, I do think that there is something about the process of killing a boss, right? It's not just about killing it. But if you come up with I think that's also why people enjoy uh doing blind raiding now in Final Fantasy, because there's something about coming up with experience. it yourself yeah exactly um and i don't know if that's what everyone feels like i also think that some people are limited on time and they will have to well press for a lot longer if they have to come up with things themselves than actually copying a strategy but it's also our mindset is to win whereas some of the people that are copying the strats they're just trying to kill the bosses and trying to get the highest world rank they can right but we're sitting here trying to beat a team and all we can do is just copy their strategy. That was like our worst tier by far. I think I've ever been a part of, to be honest. Yeah, and it's also just the main reason that I feel like viewers have this utopia in mind where like in a couple years, there's just like three to five teams in the world first race that could that could win, like that are close. It's just, it's an, it's an impossibility. There's no way. You don't get that experience of figuring out the stuff on your own. When you get a good player, mm. hey, guess what's happened to pieces, BDGs, uh, or Fat Shark Yes, or any of their guilds in the last three years who had some player that was just the best in their guild? 90% of the time, they're instantly yoinked into one of our guilds, right? So, like, anytime you're building, mm. you're building something and you actually develop talent, it just gets taken. 
and that's how it's always going to be. That's not anyone doing anything wrong. Everyone's out for themselves. That's how it's always going to be. And then also, uh, they don't get practice to, to learn that stuff. And it's just how do you develop any momentum, you know? Jinji, what is your take on smaller raid sizes? Do you prefer them or do you think 20 is really good? Uh, I think 20 is uh, it's hard for most guilds to get the 10, uh, I mean 20 really, really good players. Um, usually in a lot of guilds, there will be a handful or maybe even 10 really good players and then th they're struggling to get like a really good roster and, and the rest of the part. I think that's why a lot of people are, or guilds are also disbanding. Um, I think for the health of WoW rating in general, I think adding 10 man rating would oh, hell yeah. only be positive. I'm on I the same game. Yeah. I think if they made World of Warcraft, if this was a fresh game, even in the last three to five years, I think the raid size is 10 or lower. But I don't know if reducing the raid size from 20 would be the best decision now because there's 38 specs. And like 20 mans actually function really, really well. The only issue with 20 is zero issue with the integrity of like how good a 20 man rate is. It's just that it's hard to get that many people on a schedule, like really, really hard. <laughs> and it's really hard to get the main thing you need in any guild. And that's skill parity. You want people in general, it doesn't matter how good, but you want people to be generally around the same skill level because if you're the person who's not as good, you feel bad. You're trying your hardest and you feel bad. And if you're one of the better players, you feel like people are holding you back. I'm pretty sure all of you have experienced one or both of those things. And no one likes to be a part of that. And with smaller group sizes, you can just avoid that a lot easier. Yep. Smaller with the current means... WoW system, it wouldn't really work though. Um, I Like we have so many class buffs and whatnot, it would kind of be a problem. Uh, I don't know. I like Legion days when uh, there was no class buffs. But at the same yeah. time, we do oh, have yeah. a lot of like different class of... Yeah. Agreed. I think that's more of a yeah, like problem just... of WoW currently rather than the raids being 10 men. Mm. Like, I feel like if they can address those issues, that would just, like, open up so much more. The only issue with having 10 men and 20 men is 10 men limits their boss design ability for 20 men a lot. Like, that was actually an issue back when 25s and 10 mans were a thing. There would randomly be bosses that were super easy for 10 man or super easy for 25 man and and other random bosses that were like insanely easy for 25 man but like the hardest boss ever on 10 man for some reason so like it was like super hard for them to actually balance it and i think their entire reason for making mythic was like you know if we only have one difficulty to prepare for in one group size we can make better raid content and the raid content for a long time has been really fucking good so like i would just worry that if they tried to do two it would make raids worse yeah, I mean, I would prefer if it was just one. Definitely something to think about, though. I really wonder what would happen, man. Like, I'm trying to imagine it's like a new expansion and Blizzard makes the decision to, like, go to a 10-man. Like, 10-mans are now, like, the, the top rate difficulty. I think that would be I think potentially... Would be I think it would be good for the game. But, man, I don't know what the fuck I would do with half my roster. Just tell them to fuck, <laughs> fuck off, <laughs> I guess. Just have Liquid Team B. Yeah, Liquid Team B. This would also open up more tank slots. I don't think about it the ratio of the amount of players in the game that tank would go up relative to other roles because yep. tanks stay the same and the amount of dps gets halved healers get halved is that an issue on eu does eu struggle to find good tanks for high keys is there like not a lot of tanks to do high keys or something uh i'm probably not the best to ask um to be honest like uh, i only play with uh, now and stuff and uh Whenever I'm doing my weeklies, I pop up in the finder and like all my viewers, they're all gamers. So like everyone's like 3.2k score and I can just choose. I don't have right. those problems, <laughs> to be honest. Wait, so with now stopping in the raid and then getting Andy Brew to come tank. That's like the first like real name tank you guys have recruited, I think, when now has done his normal i don't want to raid farm so i'm gonna quit until the next tier comes out and then still play anyway bit uh is this time actually different or do you think he's okay. doing the exact same thing again i mean now uh he can't at least not this tier and uh, now he made his decision right now uh, andy is getting a shot and he fits in really nicely i think we got a it was a good pickup 
Um, and he seems to enjoy yeah, to enjoy himself, and he's also a player that's like really motivated. You can see it. Except for there's one negative dude. thing about Andy, and that's like whatever that AI thing he has going on his stream, like that just <laughs> needs to stop immediately. Wait, what is that? I, besides, heard, I heard that started from. But Echo besides Bowl. that, he's been doing. It's Wait, what? What AI he's, thing? He's easy. He's a VTuber now. It's pretty based. <laughs> like it's based. <laughs> hey man, according to him, he was saying that it was from uh, him being part of Echo now. You know, Echo's got a lot yeah. of weebs and we we do. We have a lot of weebs in the guild. I'm one of them. Who's convinced them? You're one of them. That's good. Mm. I'm a closet weep. <laughs> I don't think Robin could just you know come in and say, "Hey, I'm gonna play this tier," but he just uh, who knows what will happen in the future. But like for now, I think he just wants to focus on uh, you know M plus. Uh, like that's always Robin likes progression. But he doesn't think like the cons of him doing all of the prep, preparing like uh, all of these tanks and doing all of these farm raids every week is uh, is worth it for him. Um, he just wants to enjoy the game. Yeah, exactly. It it makes him enjoy the game less, and uh, then he loses motivation. And uh, he's a very emotional player, and uh, a lot of times very impulsive as well as a person, based on his uh, sometimes feelings in a moment and then thinking back on it changes his mind it's happened a lot i mean i played with a guy for many many uh, years and it happened with new world as well you know saying i'm not gonna play this mdi comes crawling back like a month later dude he it's, rated uh, how he is from old year to oh god castle nathria how long is that is that two years that is two years one full expansion Robin mm. did not raid in the same guild for two tiers in a row. It actually even goes before that. Like, like literally, he raided in your guild in Old Year. He raided in our guild yeah. in, in BOD. He raided in, like, yeah. a casual guild in Eternal Palace. And then he raided in our guild in Nihilotha. And then in Castle Nathra, he raided with, or, uh, with you all. And then he's been with you all ever since. And then before Old Year, he even did that before. He's like a big mind changer. He just he just is a free spirit. He's the definition of do what makes you happy. I'm different. I feel like I have a sense of responsibility in a lot of things and I will push through the bad shit a lot of times because I know the good shit is on the other side. And that's what I feel about like a lot of, a lot of these grinds. Like I don't want to farm fucking uh, Brackenhide rares on 11 characters. Like who the fuck wants to do that? But yeah, let's talk about that by the way. The... We've kind of like joked about it like years ago about how, you know, like, man, this is kind of getting out of control. Like how just more and more preparation, like remember back with like artifact power or Azerite power and BFA, it's like, oh, get, get this much uh, Azerite power before the raid comes out on this many characters or get, get 60 before Eternal Palace or Nihilotha or whatever. That was like the grind. And now it's like, just think about back then we thought we had it bad. It's literally fucking like 10 times worse now. <laughs> the amount of... The amount of shit that is required. Well, would, would you attribute that to, you know, the guild's mindsets or players' mindsets? Or is that more of like a, the game does that to you? I think the mindset... It definitely feels like people it, are just much more tryhard now. Well, yeah. I, th I think the mindset has definitely become increasingly more and more tryhard. Like, they would see us do something and then they would do it and then we would see them do something. And we're like, okay, we have to do it. Like, we can't just go into the raid when they have three more characters than us, you know? Like... You just have yeah, to do that. Yeah, because I was that. about to say, like, I, I but it's definitely the game when, too. Uh, Go ahead. When Evade was in, I remember Evade was like, "Oh, you know, we have this thing where, like, you know, I will never, we will never have to make what do you want to call it, buckets or, yep, clones or yeah, like all that. Like that wasn't a thing, right? The bird during BFA uh, or you late. Well, okay, Evade was a different case. So Evade never wanted to make buckets, and he, and even then we were like, "That's fine. You can just play one demon hunter. That guy's." That guy's definitely, like, as good as anyone who plays WoW. Evade is, if you guys are watching, like, that guy is fucking crazy good. He's as good as anyone who plays the game. Certainly as good as DH as anyone is as good at their class. And that guy did not... We were like, yo, dude, if you don't want to make buckets, we'll fucking just have you on one Demon Hunter and just send it with whatever you got. <laughs> but he didn't... He also didn't want to be the one guy in the guild that, like, didn't have to do all this work, right? Because that's, like, kind of a weird dynamic. We're like, you're like kind of interesting we we don't make exceptions like that and uh oh i would make an everyone... exception for that guy he's okay, he's okay. fucking he's a, he's a turbo gigantor brain Vader's too insane he's like he's definitely like fired up good on mage 
I, I just I don't I it's you very rarely find people so your your guild if Zalia it would play whatever healer you wanted and even he would have one of each healer but he did not want to make buckets for whichever one he was most likely to play you wouldn't be like yeah that's fine you're chilling if you, if you had to if it was between that and not having him I feel like it'd be worth it I guess it's different because Zalia is a nerd and he will he'll do it he will hate himself for not doing everything he could to win to be honest. Yeah, but what if he didn't? So it's, I guess we could make like potential exceptions if we had like a really uh, valuable, uh, you know, player in the team. Uh, not necessarily only gameplay related, but like maybe they have something to do uh, uh, because they're an officer or maybe they have something going on in their real life and they just have to cut down. Then you could make exceptions for a tier or, or whatnot. But uh, everyone the, in the guild is like super tryhard and uh, everyone is actually putting in the work, which is, I, mean, I think, yeah, part, we're of, part doing of why that. we have the success we, we, we have, you know? I don't think anyone's a slacker. Yeah, I think in general over time, this is less of the case now. We actually have the same thing, just like a bunch of people playing a bunch of different characters and playing all the time, even when they're not asked to. But that did not used to be the case. I think like, especially through all of BFA, we had like way relaxed requirements. Uh, we didn't re really require them to play a certain amount of characters. We didn't, uh, you know, if they needed to take a couple weeks off, like that was fine. Like definitely more focused on like player happiness and farm. And just as time went on, it was not really feasible to do that because of how hard you guys were going. So now we now we're just fucking just stuck doing this shit. But we people actually, don't mind yes, it. I was said it in the chat as well. Like we kind of have a saying in the guild that like everybody is replaceable. And because we have this mindset, no one thinks highly of ourselves and everyone puts in the work no matter what position you have in the guild. Uh, and actually this is a bad and a good thing. Uh, when it comes progress time, we're actually kind of like having an internal competition within each other of like who goes most degenerate. And uh, sometimes that's good. It's like sparks some healthy competition. And I think that's like how everyone in the guild is. So we have a little bit of a different mentality there. Yep. I think that's, I think more than anything else, it's also a culture diff. I think a lot of things between our guilds is very simply what an English speaking European guild is most likely going to be like with all of like, you know, you got fucking Germans, you got Italians, you got Scandinavian, ton of Scandinavian WoW players. And when you have to find some common ground, it's in general, I think a bit more strict and a bit more like try hard in general. And I think that's true in like all of gaming, but I certainly think it affects mm. like the like guilds in general. Yeah, 100%. Guys, this was a wonderful talk. Max, you opened up a lot. This was like a therapy session almost. I hope you got <laughs> a lot of, uh, you added out a little bit. Uh, I, yeah, I always just say bit. exactly how it is. That's. Mm. I say that on my stream too, but yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful company. I'll see you guys. I'll be here tomorrow as well for some uh, some good games. Oh some yeah. MDI watch party. Good night, guys. Have a great stream. Yeah. Have a good night, man. That was a that was a raid talk we normally do after uh after raids. I just think like things have gotten so extremely degenerate in the last two that that has stopped happening, and there was absolutely no way that that conversation could have taken place within a month of that raid ending. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way, like, in chat or in any other place, it just wouldn't have been able to happen. So that was, uh, that was probably good.